Woo! Feels like I'm just here for the music. I know we're live, but Phil's here for the music. It just feels so official. All right. Hey, everyone. I am Shannon, a.k.a. Small Press Shannon, and I am here at Bat City Comics, as usual, to wind down your weekend. And as always, I've got my lovely co-host, the great Phil, a.k.a. Wednesday Phil. <laughs> Thank you for saying lovely. Yes, absolutely. I appreciate that. Not many people call me lovely. We put your face on camera every week, obviously. It's a lovely face. I know. It's <laughs> tough. I feel like I was always meant for radio and not to be on camera. <laughs> And yet, here you are. Here I am. Yes. I'm going to uh, get this up and running for comments, but while I'm doing that, how are you doing, Phil? How's your week been? Uh, it's been pretty good. I've uh, definitely gained weight, <laughs> which <laughs> makes walking up a flight of stairs more difficult, but I think it's like happiness weight. You know how sometimes yeah. when you're content in the world, you just put on a little weight, you stop caring as much, eat a little more unhealthy. Uh, so I definitely am feeling it, but there's a new Kanye album out, and it's amazing. Oh. <laughs> Damn it, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> right, we have Matt in charge of sound effects, so. Let me enjoy my Kanye West. <laughs> <laughs> Let him have his moment. <laughs> um, but no, it's been, it's been a really good week. So, how have you been? Good. Um, this has been a really, a really awesome week. I've been in the store full-time all week this week for the the first week in a long time so that felt really great to be here all week long get to hang out every, uh, with everybody especially Matt um, so lots of um, great and wonderful things coming up really soon in our store now that that is the way that that's going to be going super excited about that um, got to see Shang-Chi and I'm going to throw that out there right now so that all <laughs> of you know if you saw it there are no spoilers allowed in the comments tonight yes uh, Phil has not seen it, and so have probably many other people watching tonight. So we want to make sure that if you did see Shang-Chi, you're welcome to say it, you know, mm -hmm. that you saw it. But pretty much leave it at that, because uh, even opinions are spoilers, so we don't want to go too far into what people thought about it. So um, it's a Marvel movie. You know Thanos demands your silence. Don't talk about <laughs> it um, until it's been out for a while and people have had a chance to see it. Uh, that said... Go, go see it. Um, if you're comfortable with going to a movie theater, go out and check it out. Um, other than that, we got some wine to wind down our weekend. Uh, this is Chateau Smith. I'm going to hold this a little closer. I'm terrible at holding the water, mm. wine bottle to you. Um, and this comes to us from our subscriber, Blake. This is his favorite bottle of wine. He says he likes to get this and drink comic drink that no read comics and drink this wine um, and so I actually have not had any of the wine yet and yet that's already how this night is gonna go um, so uh, shout out to Blake for being awesome dropping this off also shout out to Alyssa um, who is the other half of Blake and Alyssa who came and helped out this week and filed away so many backstock comics like I'm now like the bins are too full we're so great we've like filled up so many new comics so thanks Alyssa um, and if you're out there and you're like hey I want to volunteer at Bat City how does that work what am I able to do um, shoot us a message on here on Instagram through email at batcitycomicprofessionals at gmail.com uh, name of the store at gmail is a really great easy way to get a hold of me at any time um, and yeah, we'll find something for you to do. Don't worry. There's always a million and one things that need to be done. And Matt and I are happy to allow you to do them. So, um, <laughs> I'm going to taste this line that Blake gave us. You just tasted it. Was it good? Yes, it's fantastic. I may be getting drunk tonight. <laughs> <laughs> For mm. warning. Mm. Oh yeah, that's nice. I was it's worried it was going to be a little sweet because it... It kind of has a sweet smell to it. I was like, it's going to be like a dry, but a dry sweet. But, no, yeah, it's really, it's a nice balance, like, all the way around. And this is a Cab Sab, uh, which you usually can't go wrong with. And it's from Washington State, which I also just enjoy going to Washington State. So now I know they have great wine up there. So I've never been, but now I'll go for their wine. You'll go for the wine? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little wine tour of Washington State. 
Yes, that would be awesome. Well, that is um, Chateau Smith is what we're drinking tonight. So um, if you've got a cool drink that you're drinking at home, drop it in the comments. Um, I'm always interested in what people are drinking. Like some people are like, oh, I'm drinking along with you. And <laughs> some people are like, I don't drink. And I want to know either way, like, what are you drinking? Because I just really like love to, uh, outside of things like, you know, this and everything. I just drink water 99% of the time. Mm -hmm. So I'm always like, tell me about your exciting drinks, people. <laughs> I can't have most of them. So just tell me, uh, tell me what you got. Yeah. <laughs> so. I think that's fair. I'll say before I came on here, it was just sweet tea for me. Just sweet tea for you? Yeah. Yeah. But now, wine. Do you have a favorite place to stop and get a sweet tea? Like if you had to drive through sweet tea or go to a restaurant and order sweet tea, like where's oh, your sweet tea choice? Man, that's a tough question. I feel like any place that serves fried chicken, even though I'm a vegetarian. Has, <laughs> has the best tea. Yeah, usually, you know, any place that's a southern style. Right, like Chicken, chicken Express, Express has great sweet tea. Yes. I can't have it anymore because yes, of the caffeine in it, but mm -hmm. oh my God, is it good. Yeah, I've been drinking a lot of sweet tea from Whataburger lately. Oh, nice. You know, it's pretty good. But most of the time, I either make it myself or I just get it, whatever's at H-E-B. Yeah. Did you get that, like, Red Diamond jug of sweet tea? So I stopped drinking Red Diamond. Um, mostly, I can't even think of the brand. Gold Peak. Oh, Gold Peak, yeah. Gold Peak is the one that, because uh, they, they do it with cane sugar now. So oh, it's, nice. So it's, it's postponed me getting diabetes just slightly. Just a little bit? <laughs> just, for a little, just for a little bit longer. Well, Chad said, if you go to Washington, go for the apple orchards. Didn't even know that was an option. Uh, that's definitely something I'd like to do. Interesting, okay. And uh, Gomez said, love your shirt, man. I'm assuming he means you, because he said man. Um, and you've yeah, got on a blade know. shirt. Yeah, so. I'm rocking the blade tonight. Right, that's sweet. Oh. I haven't even seen that shirt. That's awesome. Yeah, I got it at uh, Dallas Fan Expo because I drove all the way to Dallas and I forgot my suitcase. Oh, man. So I had no clothes. That's and I went to those giant, like... T-shirt vendors? Yeah, where it's like six shirts for $54. <laughs> and you're like, why such an obscure number? But I guess I'll take this. It's because with tax, it comes out to a normal number. That makes sense. That, so that way when they when they add in the tax, uh, it's just like a regular dollar amount. So that way if people are paying with cash, then they're giving an even dollar amount instead of like a weird number then. And they don't have to worry about the way the change works out. Interesting. I didn't even think about that. Worked at a lot of conventions <laughs> in my life. <laughs> it shows. <laughs> Um, that said, we don't have a lot, a lot of books tonight, but we've got a lot of cool things to talk about even still. Um, this is kind of a, a light week. It's that week where, uh, like DC was almost completely annuals. Uh, Marvel had a couple of books to wrap up and start some new things going on. Um, and because of last week's 75 pile high oh indie book gosh. and the week yeah. before being like 35 piled high indie books, we're kind of on a, a light week. I think the only person that really put out a book this week was Colin Bunn. So Shocker. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> that said, we still have 75 titles to talk to you about. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> and they're all Colin Bunn. Yes. That's... That's, we'll take a break there. Before we get to Cullen Bun, we're going to give you some prizes. So, good boy. Prize! Phil's still not on the prize train. It's fine. He's going to get there eventually. I'm rebellious. It's fine. Whatever. You'll enjoy it someday. Um, the first prize we have for you tonight is a little bit of girl power. We've got the Mighty Valkyries number one, and then we've got the Tales from the Dark Multiverse Wonder Woman story, which was actually really cool. Uh, in the original version, of course, she's fighting Hecate, and she actually is, like, defeating her. This is, like, what would happen if, like, Hecate actually took over Wonder Woman's body, which is pretty cool. Um, and we are going to give you this, if you can tell us, um, Aquaman first appeared in what comic and issue? So I need the name of the comic and the issue number. If you can tell me that, you get both of these, uh, awesome comics tonight. So, uh... Also, I've been told to tell everybody, if you're not reading The Mighty Valkyries, you need to get on it. It's actually a really, really good story that a lot of people are missing. Um, it kind of mm -hmm. spurred out of, like, you know, some... It was, like, Mighty Valkyrie story was a part of King in Black, and there was all this stuff that went on with it, and people kind of missed uh, that it continued on. And it's apparently, like, our, our Marvel subscribers are really, really like, no, you need to read M Mighty Valkyrie. Like, don't miss it. It's been so good. Um, 
not Silver Age Aquaman, Gomez. I need actual Aquaman, original Aquaman, first appearance in what comic and issue? Gotta go back to the Golden Age, buddy. Uh, Leslie, I'm guessing this time it's for my shirt since you can't see Phil's. So I'm gonna take that. Thank you. This is my amazing <laughs> Sabrina. She looks so cool. I'm so glad that they had Sabrina shirts. Like Matt got me this. I'm just gonna say he always picks the best shirts. If you ever need a shirt, well, first call Juan <laughs> to design one for you. And <laughs> uh, yeah, Juan shirts are cool. Matt's booing himself but wand shirts are awesome so if you ever need a really cool nerdy shirt and you can't find one check out uh, Chongo ATX's art because he has some amazing ones if you want to win these books you have to tell me in what book and uh, issue did Aquam issue number and book title did Aquaman first appear talking golden age I'm going to give you a hint in that it was 80 years ago because this week is the 80th anniversary of Aquaman. So if you can find the appearance of Aquaman from 1941, you're on the right track. I feel like my answer would be wrong, but I also think that... Is this your answer? Because the answer's right there. No. Okay. Well, no. then it, you would have been wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking like Brave and the Bold. No. Maybe like an early, early Brave and the Bold. But that was until the 60s, I feel like. Yes. Even, or like late 15? Uh, Chad, you are correct, and Chad is giving it to Gomez for his his try. So, Gomez, you are going to be taking home this Wonder Woman and Mighty Valkyries. Um, it is More Fun Comics n uh, number 73 back in 1941. Dang. Yeah. And I guess we'll just skip directly to that to tie it in as we go in to talk about comics that came out this week that we enjoyed um i would like to point out that once again it is the 80th anniversary of aquaman um he's he got a release he got all the covers i will say he didn't get a day um and i'm okay with the fact but i am excited because i was like "Ooh, which ones are going to get a day which ones aren't going to get a day like to go with their release and i am happy to say that wonder woman is getting a day so oh, at I least so. all of the big three are, are getting their day but here is aquaman 80th anniversary i'm just going to show you some of these awesome covers it's the 100 page spectacular um there is stories in here from marguerite bennett has a story uh stephanie phillips has a story Jeff Johns has a story. Jeff Johns' story is actually about um, Jackson and uh, Black Manta. Oh, So okay. it's super, it was actually like a whole like story about your family and all of that, like your connection to your parent. I am going to say that, because I, I said I was going to go on this rant today, and so I really am going to do it. <laughs> Everybody talks about how they either can connect with Batman or Superman. Like, oh, if you had, like, super loving parents and you felt like your home life was, like, super mm -hmm. secure, you're like, I really like Clark Kent, I like the Kents, I like Superman. But most everybody else is like, oh, I like that Batman's, like, more realistic, like, he's on his own, he's independent. I don't understand why they haven't capitalized on the fact that Aquaman is the child of divorced parents, essentially, and 70% yeah. pe of people in this world should identify with Aquaman instead of going with, like, he's the king of mermaids, essentially. Right. They should be going with the fact that, like, telling me these heartfelt stories of him as, like, a divorced child. Like, where is this door? We need more of that. And it's always, like, the first two pages of an Aquaman story, and then it goes into the depth. But we've had so many stories of Batman and Superman where they, even Wonder Woman, where they talk about their relationship with their family, and it doesn't ever go into those, like, depth, like, just blow over it and I'm like 70% of people 70% of people would yeah. connect with Aquaman if you would just tell them the emotional journey story that we need so uh, DC if you're listening and while I most of the time hope that you're not listening to this uh, live stream uh, today I'm hoping that you're listening and I hope that you know that um, I'm available to write a story about Aquaman being the child of divorced parents, but also just give it to anybody who understands that concept, which is, once again, 70% of the people in America. <laughs> um, there's that one. One more for you from the 90s variant before I get to my favorite. This is actually my favorite of the Aquaman 80th anniversaries. This is the Golden Age variant. It's a Michael Cho cover, Ooh. which explains why it's my favorite, but this was an absolutely gorgeous uh, Aquaman 80th anniversary cover. We still have these. I should, I believe, are all of them. We might have one more. But if you're looking for one of the Aquaman 80th anniversary covers, let us know. Um, 
And when it comes to the 80th anniversary covers in general for any of your favorite characters, always give us a heads up on which one you want because that's 10 covers. So to make sure we get an order for the one that you want and we have it for you, just let us know so we can make sure um, we get that set aside. And yes, Chad, I see you want that Golden Age one. Absolutely. I will. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so Chad wants the Golden Age it's one. A, it's a great cover. And then Gomez, you want one as well. You said the the eighty the eighties cover. Okay, um, cool. I'll look. I'll grab you those. Um, thanks, guys. We'll go through it. We'll find it. Gomez, I'll send you a picture just in case you want to short through them. That's the eighties one, Gomez. There no, it is. No, I still found it. Okay. I did. Unless see. you want the Golden Age one as well. That right. Makes sense also. So we'll get those saved aside for y'all. And um, again, Wonder Woman's is coming up. Yes, he said yes, that's the one. Uh, Wonder Woman is coming up soon. So keep an eye out for those um, because that is going to be, I feel like that one's going to go a lot faster because Wonder Woman's been flying off the shelves recently. So we'll see where this goes. That applause. That applause sounded like the ocean. And I was like, oh, that's <laughs> a... Uh, that's an Aquaman one. Oh, he wants so, gold the Golden Age. Age. Cool, I got gotcha. you. I got you. Um, writing that down for you, Gomez. Okay. Um, other books that came out this week. So I'm gonna go just really quickly with another um big two book. This is the Last Annihilation event is going on. It's like a mini event that's hopping over a couple of titles at Marvel, and this is the Wiccan and Hulkling tie into it, and you get. The story, like you get that Last Annihilation like tie-in and everything that's going on with that. I honestly, for me, I was like, I don't really care about that because I'm not reading the event. I was only here for the fact that there's this beautiful backstory that goes throughout the whole thing of Billy and Teddy's like relationship. And it shows them like meeting in high school and then like how they've built up over time, like this re the relationship. Like it shows like a little bit of like Young Avengers and like just these little connection points. It showed like last year during Empire, like with their like getting married and everything, or like the lead into them, like getting engaged. I guess I should say. Mm -hmm. So it's just like this whole like awesome thing that shows um, where their wedding rings came from and how they use them to like even more so like amplify not just their relationship but their power. So it's like, this beautiful Wicked and Hulkling story and then there's like every other page is like action that takes you back into the Last Annihilation thing. So if you're reading Last Annihilation, uh, this event that's currently ongoing, you definitely need to get this as your tie-in to like this is like the main point of the story mm -hmm. uh but if you're just a wicked and hulkling fan you just need it because it's adorable and i because i think that's the reason i didn't pick it up is because i saw that last annihilation i thought mm -hmm. oh no i'm not reading this event at all uh, i probably shouldn't read this but i actually really like both these characters especially wiccan um from like the young avengers stuff yeah uh, so I, I definitely, I definitely want to check this out. You could like skip like every like third or fourth page because that's the last annihilation story and still get a complete story. Like if you just read the little backstory, it's like a complete story on its own because it's like when okay. they do flashbacks in a movie mm -hmm. and they're kind of tell you the whole thing. This kind of tells you like a whole full story in the flashbacks. And then there's like the other story is like the action story is the frame tell over that backstory. So super cool and Dormammu's in it and so I was like ooh Dormammu so now is this a one shot or this is a one shot that goes with Last Annihilation there was also the one that had Cable uh, last week and then right. um, there is I believe the whole thing wraps up in Guardians of the Galaxy coming up soon okay so it wasn't a very big event it was just kind of like a mini event that wrapped up some loose ends on different things that and makes sense. leads to something else, I'm sure, as they usually do. Because I feel like there's been a few Annihilation events. Yes, and this is the last one. <laughs> Allegedly. We all know That's that it's never the last says. one. That's what it says. It says it's the last one, but let's be real. It will <laughs> never be the last one. Um, I'm going to stick with Marvel for just one more second and then go back to like our indie stuff. But uh, Demon Days is out this week. Um, this is Peach Momoko's, uh, really beautiful story that she's doing all on her own, uh, writing and, and doing the art for, like, this is our first big, like, Peach Momoko's in interior art story, mm -hmm. um, and it's just, it's a great mixture of the Marvel characters and actual, like, ancient fictional stories, like, the, the folklore stories mixed with 
the Marvel characters in the story. And I, you don't have to know anything about any Marvel anything to get on this book. Um, they are all like labeled number one and they're each different, but yet they do tie together right. within them. So while they're all like individual one shots and you could pick it up and get like a cute like little story that just stands there, this one kind of starts to tell you that they're really not as standalone as you think they are. Um, and it kind of brings both of the two that have happened already together and kind of starts the story together with those two. Okay. So. Uh, I read the first one, obviously, because it was, Psylocke. it was Psylocke. The second one was Wolverine's daughter, right? Mariko? Isn't that yes, her name? Yes, it is Mariko. And now this brings that and a couple more pieces of that puzzle together. So, okay. Is this Spider-Gwen in this one? Is um, It's one? Silk. Oh. I believe it's supposed to be Silk. That would make more sense to the Asian culture story that it is. Um, but she and her outfit's like black and red and and uh, white. So, but yeah, so we're seeing a little bit more. Like this kind of continues that journey a little bit. Mm -hmm. So um, if you have picked up the other ones, you definitely pick this up. All of these... All of these Demon Days have so many amazing covers. It's always super hard to decide, like, which <laughs> cover everybody wants. It stresses me out. Literally, the co covers of Demon Days stress me out more than giving people covers of anything else. I'm always like, well, then there's this one. But then there's this one. And, oh, my gosh, they like this, too. And they're all beautiful. And they're going to want them all. And I don't know which one to give everybody. And so I kind of just want to give everybody one of each and let you deal, y'all deal with it. Which like I'm like, I think it's totally fair. That's what I usually do for you. Um, <laughs> or I'll give you like the four that I think you might like and I'm like ah, he can figure it out from there like there are a lot of people who do that if you ever show up and your box has like four or five of the same title in it it's because I didn't know which cover you would like and I thought you might like multiples and I'm giving you the choice I am not requiring you to buy all of them you are never required to buy anything in your box unless it's like a CGC that you shipped out and even then you could just talk to Matt um, he, who knows <laughs> um, but unless it's like your actual own book that you're picking up and paying for like that's different but anything that like we put in your box whether it's your subscription or a suggestion you're never required to buy it so just know if I put four of a cover in your of a copy of a book with different covers in your box, it's because I want you to sort through them, not because I think you need to buy all four. That's my totally understandable. I have to say I appreciate this book existing because I was because I, I believe before this. I'm if I'm wrong, someone let me know. But I don't think Peach Momoko ever did interiors no, this up is, to this, this point. No, this is the interior, like, debut of Peach Momoko. And my whole thing was like, oh, is she just always going to be a cover artist? Because I wanted to see what she could do mm -hmm. with a full issue. And so far, these look impressive. They are so beautiful. Yeah. I actually wasn't sure, like, just from the early covers that Peach did, I was like, Peach is good, but I don't know if it's my art style. And then I saw the interiors of this, and I was like, no, I love this. Like, mm -hmm. and now I'm... Now I'm drawn to more peach covers than I was before I saw the expansiveness of what she could do with that art. Mm hmm So. Yeah. I've, I've enjoyed these Demon Days books so far. Yeah. Um, on a complete opposite end of the spectrum, uh, Sweet Paprika number two is out. This is Mirko and Dolfo. And if you know Marco and Dolfo, you know it's definitely more on the mature side in anything that he ever does. But it's kind of like comical like try to be like rom-com cute in a in a adult form and uh super pika is all about a girl who her she's a devil she's a little demon devil and she's a little devil and not little because she's an adult she's also like the head of like trying to become an executive at a publishing company and she's working her tail off quite literally, pun intended. <laughs> um, and at the same time, like, her dad, who is in the hospital, and he's a devil as well, he's always telling her, like, you're not modest enough. Nobody's going to want you because you're you're too revealing. And it's so funny to hear, like, this devil, like, that's super conservative. And then there's this angel guy who's always trying to, like, get in her pants. So it's kind of funny because she's, like, the working, like, hardworking woman and this, like, guy who everybody thinks is this perfect angel is just kind of 
like trashy like get in your pants kind of guy like the whole time and definitely the kind of guy you don't leave your drink unattended by kind of situation and he's like I got this like everybody loves me and she doesn't love him um and then she's basically at this point she's her way that she's moving up in her career she's cultivated this book this book that they have coming out she's cultivated a whole entire movie deal for them and the whole time she's like so excited about this book deal and they're finally going to put her in charge of it and she's like trying to deal with her anxiety about it because she's really an anxiety ridden person and the worst part is is that you find out who how her connection to like the main actor like what her connection to the main actor is and why she's so stressed out about it by the end of this book and you like feel her stress with her <laughs> like you're like oh that's gonna suck um and so this whole book like you just like feel like want to like cheer for her you're like just get it together paprika you got this kind of like in the same way with save yourself where you're right. like you can do this like the whole time yeah. you get in that same method like with paprika in here you're like you've got this paprika i believe in you and you're like oh ignore those people they're awful so it's really cute kind of feels like a standard rom-com because you got the one girl who's working then you got the other girls that are trying to like cut her down you got the boss who doesn't take her seriously you right. got like the assistant that's a mess like there's a scene in here where paprika has told her in issue one that her tea always needs to be like a certain temperature or she won't drink it and like then in this one she goes to eat her lunch and it's not there and she's like where is my lunch why is my lunch here and the assistant's like i was trying to make sure the tea stayed as hot as it's supposed to be and like the assistant's like panicking she's like well where's the like where's the lunch and she finally gets her lunch and she's about to eat it and like something happens and she runs off and then like the dog comes in like after her lunch and it becomes like this literally like it's just a rom-com it's just made with angels and devils <laughs> so i appreciate that i've always felt like uh, Mark Andolfo makes pretty good books, mm -hmm. uh, especially art wise. Yes, his art is is Mark Mocha Andolfo's art is just really great. Mm -hmm. um, it's always fun. It's just definitely one of those like not suitable for kids kind of books, but no, it's I, a lot of fun for. I adults. had to stop showing pages. Yeah, <laughs> because of inappropriate material. So things to come that were lit yes. literally once again <laughs> yes. pun intended. <laughs> 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 um. Speaking of things that are angels and demons and <laughs> things, uh, Second Coming Only Begotten is out. This is volume two, issue four. four. Um, in Diamond, this is actually listed as canceled, yet it suddenly started coming out again, so I'm very excited. I got super sad because there's this long delay and the book was listed as canceled, and then suddenly it's back, and I'm so happy. Um, if you don't know Second Coming, it is literally the story of if Jesus had to be roommates with Superman. Mm -hmm. And basically, God has decided that Jesus dying at 33 years and not actually like making the impact that God wanted him to make means that he kind of needs help. And then you flash forward to the future and you see Superman and God's like, now that's what the son of God <laughs> should have been like. And he's not really Superman. He's like Sunfire or something. But he's like, that's what he should have been like. And the superhero and his wife want to have a baby. So God's like, hey, I'll make you a deal. You take in my son. You raise him and practice. You do a good job. I'll get you a baby. I got that power. And so Jesus comes back to earth to live with this superhero. And he is basically redoing all of his things all over again. And it sounds super sacrilegious, but it's it's actually all about learning those same lessons and teaching those and teaching people to be good people. And, and um, Mark Russell writes it. And when he, he wrote his letter at the beginning of the trade, and he was like, you know, I was raised in a very like Christian environment and I was always very confused by what I read versus what I heard versus what I saw and this has just been like me trying to put it all together in my head of like what would that really look like in our real world now mm -hmm. and it's hilarious but every issue teaches you some incredible moral story by the end of it in a way that you did not think you were going to get there and uh, this is volume two. We two, I believe, have volume one in stock because I'm obsessed with this book. Um, <laughs> and it's such a it's such a good story. It's always hilarious, and uh, it it just like I said, it always has like this great story. Like, but one of my favorite scenes in volume one is they're like walking. The superhero and Jesus are walking down the street, 
And they turn a corner and they come by like a Catholic church and there's the giant like crucifix like outside. And Jesus is like, oh my God, trigger warning. <laughs> like, holy cow, what yeah. are they doing? Why is it there? And he's like, that's the sign of your people. And he's like, that's what they chose. That was the worst day of my life. Why would you do that? And he's like hyperventilating like between his legs kind of situation. And he's like, this doesn't, no, like, oh my gosh, like, no, I can't handle this. Like, and he's like, are you going to be okay? And he's like, I don't know. And it's <laughs> like this this great conversation and everything ends up like having like a funny way of asking and thinking about things that we've all probably thought at one point or another um and they do a really good job with telling you a great funny story and um also giving you kind of a superman story in the background at the same time of like and giving you that like are the superheroes like the people who are the heroes even though they're still flawed characters or like can they like is their human element the weakness that makes them stronger or is it what makes them weak like you get a lot out of this book okay so uh i thoroughly enjoyed volume one uh i'm trade waiting for this one uh but i i trust that anything with mark russell's name on it it's true uh and he's great at he's great at commentary mm -hmm. and i kind of started when i first read that that first volume i was like oh man he's just gonna like crap all over organized religion and that's not what he and does. that's not the case at mm -hmm. all and i remember that was kind of the reason why he had trouble getting it off the ground well it was originally supposed to be published through dc mm -hmm. and it was actually like on its like it was already on the schedule it was coming out and then uh it got picked up by a certain news channel <laughs> and they tore it apart for that very reason right. like oh this you know this is an attack on religion and this and all those things and they can't dc was like we can't we can't right. put this out uh we can't do it and so it got dropped and then it came out through ahoy ahoy was like we got no problems picking it up <laughs> like we have we're, we're fine this stuff we're putting out that's that's the least of our problems yeah. and so they picked it up and i'm so glad they did because it's definitely a great story that needs to exist yeah i agree i definitely agree all right, we're getting into the Cullen Bun of it all. Um, oh, this! I forgot this was a Cullen Bun book. My well, guys, I was literally serious. There are four Cullen Bun books out this week, minimum. So get ready. Uh, I might do them all at one time, just because it's hilarious and yet awesome that to, somebody has four books out at the same we time. We have to end on us on the good one though. Okay, uh, like of the Cullen Buns, or just like of in the, general? Yeah, of the Cullen. Did you buns. give it back to me? No, I did not. No, you did not. Okay, we'll grab it. Um, Cool. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay, go for it. Uh, the first one is Parasomnia. And I, my favorite thing about Parasomnia is honestly and truthfully that the cover is reversible. Um, I love that if you flip the cover over. Oh, like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh my gosh. That's, uh, he's still on his first glass of wine. <laughs> it's been a week. Um, it is all about a family and every issue i'm not quite sure what happened to the son but this one finally said it outright the son was kidnapped and it put a lot of strain on the parents and like they're divorced now and the dad has been trying to find the son and the only time he can hunt the son down is when the son is dreaming and the dad is dreaming they end up in like the same dream world and the dad is on this quest to find his son and he leads through the dream world which means everybody in society thinks the dad is crazy um, and so we're starting to see a little bit more of this, putting it all together. Honestly, other than the cover, the greatest part of this book is that Andrea Muti does the art. Yeah, I was just about to say this art is... A Maniac of New York, a Bunny Mask. So, yeah, if you are a fan of either of those books, honestly, just pick this up for Andrea Muti's art. It's fantastic. I just... The... The weird color palette that's always on Mutie's art is just such a cool thing. And it's it's like hyper detailed yet not detailed at all at the same time. No. And I just, I love, I love that. But have you checked this one out at all? I haven't because again, Cullen Bunn, you see that name and you think, <laughs> I, can, I can wait. But every time I open this book, I'm like, I should, I should probably give it at least a a read through yeah, at least a chance for that first issue issue one i was like oh this is really interesting and it but i also felt like i didn't know like sometimes i was lost in where i was mm -hmm. issue two i was just lost in where the entire story was going <laughs> like i was like i don't understand again because after issue one i was like oh it's like a boy he's in a coma 
he's lost, but he's, like, asleep. He's in a coma world or something. And then issue two, I was like, no, he's been kidnapped. And then I was like, okay. And now in issue three, I'm like, oh, it's both. He's kidnapped, but when he's asleep, they can follow him. And, like, so they need him to be asleep. He might be in a coma. The whole, he's, like, in a coma wherever they are. And so the dad keeps trying to go to sleep. Mm-hmm. And, and issue one had all these sad moments. Like, the dad is basically homeless at this point, And he's sleeping on the park benches. And, like, the cops come to wake him up. And he's like, no, I need to sleep. I have to find my son. And they're like, the crazy man is like... He's like, I was in the middle of a battle. Because he ends up in this different, like, 1800s-style world. In a, a battle against demons and pirates and all this stuff. And he's just really trying to find it. And so this one, I was like, oh, issue three. Like, now I get now I get everywhere we're at. I might have to go back and read one and two to try to <laughs> see how they all piece together. Because I was really confused, like, going into into this issue about where I was. But it, I'm here for Andrew Meade's art. I'm not going to lie. So with your three-issue rule, this is a yay. With my three-issue rule, I don't know. Uh, honestly, for me, with this, because I'm still a little confused about where... If Andrea Muti wasn't on art, I might be like, maybe? Mm-hmm. I'm in to see where the rest of the art goes, because as the issues get more intense, the art gets cooler, as it did with Maniac of New York, where it was like the more intense things got, right. the art just became even more like splashy and cool and like told this great story honestly like you could take Colin's whole writing out of it and I would still read the book just for silent issues done by Andrew Muti and honestly Andrew Muti if you want to do a silent issue I'm pretty sure we would all just buy it for your <laughs> art um, uh, yeah, not not of a Colin Bunn book just of a book in general like make up your own book and just do it silently um but yeah so i don't know i'm again i think i feel like i have to go back and read one and two and see if like with one and two and three if it makes more sense but i was a little confused about like where we were um in it so all right well this is his dark horse release yes now for his he has two dark horse releases this week because he's got two books on every publisher every indie publisher right now um this is one of his boom ones which is basilisk of the four this week, it's my lowest ranking. Um, in the sense of I don't know what's going on in Parasomnia, I have zero idea what's going on in Basilisk. Um, honestly, it's I don't even really know how to explain it. Um, it's about two girls, one of them who's kind of a member of a cultish society that all have some kind of magical powers, and the other is a girl who's family was killed by the people in the cults that have all the magical powers and they're now working together to take down these cultish people but there's not a lot to that story that's kind of giving you that you're kind of making all of that up from context clues as you go along and so um if you are a fan of basilisk and you can explain better what the story is about <laughs> please put it in the comments because this is one that like every time i read it i feel like i like, there's parts of the story missing each issue, which I know is something I say that with indie books, Colin Bunn has had that happen a lot. I think that with, like, when he writes for Marvel, Marvel has such a big outline of, like, this has to happen, this has to happen within your story to keep it in continuity, Mm -hmm. that those little gaps are filled in. But I feel like with with some of his indie books, it's like he had an idea and he rushed it out to production. And it's like, oh, I have to focus on this other seven books over here so like this week this issue is going to be the one that doesn't get a lot and I feel like Basilisk is is such a cool concept that he's like if I don't do a lot with the story it'll still translate as a cool concept and I'm at the point now where I'm like we're on issue four I need more of the story like we need to unfold some of this a little bit more and I think it's a little slow to get to the unfolding but we did see a little bit of it in issue four um I just, I still don't know who the characters are, really, and why I care about them. Um, Something happens in this issue that's supposed to be tragic, and I didn't really have an attachment to the characters yet to have that feeling. So I just hope that in, like, the flip side of the series, like, the other, like, the next half of the series or the next third of the series that we see a little bit more because it's stuff's about to get, like, really crazy in here, and I hope that uh, that craziness translates a little bit more of the story through it yeah i is this is the one though that's kind that's of the gaining one that's heating some up. traction mm-hmm. right 
So it's interesting, though, because I feel like that's probably more of a collectability thing in people who may not be actually reading the book. I don't know. I actually am really curious to find out because there's a lot of people who've come in and been like, oh, my God, Basilisk. Like, do you have, like, you have issue, you know, you have, we have a, a virgin variant from the 1 in 10, I believe it was, 1 in 25. The CGC one? Yeah. One per store. One per store. We have the one per store of the first issue, uh, CGC, and everybody's coming in like, oh, my God, Basilisk. Like, this book is so hot. And I'm like, I, I'm always like, what is it that draws you to it? Because I really want to know. Because for me, I feel like I'm I miss something. Like right. I'm like, did I skip an issue? Is really where I'm <laughs> at. Because I feel like I missed something in the story, and it's not a bad story. I just feel like I missed something, and so I'm like, did I skip an issue? Like I don't know. But again, the concept is really really cool because I do like the idea of like this everybody in this cult type setting that has a power it's all a different sense like one person does something with their eyes one person mm. does something with their like smell since your sense of smell one person does some sound and so like the girl that wants to fight them she has to embody like cover her body so that nobody can touch her and so she can't see and so she can't hear and so it's mm. like she has to basically fight with no senses and so it's cool super cool concept i'm yeah. really in on the concept i just really feel like i missed something and i want more I feel like that's what you, that's what I feel like that's what everyone, at least I know I say with Cullen Bunn, where it's like, great concept, I like what you're going to, I like that you're taking the story and doing something with it, but what you're actually going to do with it, I don't know if that, yeah, that's going to be anything worthwhile. We'll, we'll see. see. If you we'll like, see. <laughs> if you like Basilisk, pl Basilisk, or if you're reading it, let us know in the comments, like, what your favorite parts of it are, because I really want to know what everybody like what everybody likes about books and that's one of those where again i'm like i hear everybody talking about how it's heating up want to know why i want to know what it is that makes people what if we just what if we just live in this bubble where everyone else loves cullen bunn and it's just us who doesn't right and i don't dislike cullen bunn All i just right, think yeah. there's like a lot when you put out that much something's gonna suffer and mm -hmm. i feel like a couple of his books fall flat this is definitely one of the better ones uh, Phantom on the Scan, this is his Aftershock title, this is now the end of it. We have about seven or eight people who get this title and it's like the first book that they read when it comes in. Really? Um, it's all about a group of people that have psychic powers and they team up together to figure out why a bunch of them have started dying. So, uh, cool art. I definitely think Mark Torres' art is really cool. Mm -hmm. I like the, again, I like that color palette. It kind of works really well because when they get into the more psychic realm of what they're dealing with, it gets kind of like almost Martin Simmons-y where it like fuzzes out and you don't really know like what's happening. And I'm like, oh, they're doing something psychically. Uh, this does wrap up the entire story. It's an Aftershock book. So, of course, issue five is the wrap up of it. Um, and it kind of gives you, this is one of those Aftershock books that where I feel like issue five actually had a solid ending. It told us everything that was missing. It gave us a little bit of, like, the rest of the backstory. It gave us a little bit of, like, a story to go in this particular issue. And then it kind of just, like, wraps up everything. So I was like, hey, we, like, I am not, I'm not like, oh, my God, you have to tell me more. This one I was like, hey, you actually wrapped this up. It made sense. Everything's good. And it kind of just finished, like, the whole thing. I honestly think this could have also been an, a, a one-shock. This could have been an oversized one shot from Aftershock, and it would have been it would have all fit in there really nicely too. But okay, yeah, this was one that I dropped off after the first issue because again I was like I like this concept, I like the art. The art was I don't remember the art being this spectacular. It's really good. Um, but again, it was just kind of that like, do I want to trust? Cullen Bun, and now that I'm looking at this art again, I'm like, maybe, <laughs> maybe I, I need to give this one a shot. I definitely think that you'll like the art the whole way through, and just like little bits and pieces here and there. Like again, the, my thing with Cullen Bun is I either want him to make everything into a one shot, or I want him to make really more detailed series because some of the concepts I'm like flesh this out a lot. And some of them, I'm like, you can condense. This could have gone either way. Like, because there's certain characters in here that if he would have spent entire issues just delving into who this character was, it would have been great. I could have used, like, an issue for each of the characters in the same way that, like, James Tynion, like, in each issue of Nice House has kind of given us a little bit mm -hmm. more of each person's backstory. If he would have given us a little bit more of each person's backstory and this would have been, like, a full 12-part series, it would have been... 
um, a really interesting way to like explore those characters. But again, I'm here for the art. It's so gorgeous. I mean, yeah, I, I'm definitely gonna have to go back. I guess I'll have to get this one in trade, unless you have all five issues. I do much. have all five issues. Yeah, hmm. it's right behind you on the okay. wall. I may have to, cause yeah, this art is pretty cool. Yeah. Dan Dan just said this looks way cool. It is absolutely cool, Dan. Like definitely if you haven't picked it up, check out the way that, that some of those earlier issues when they're like when stuff is happening to them cuz when they cuz when these people die, they don't just die. They like explode. They like are literally spontaneously combusting. Mm -hmm. And so the way that that's done in this art style just looks super cool. Okay. Not that I condone like spontaneous combustion or anything, but like it's a it cool, looks super it's, cool. It's a cool concept, though. Right. It's one of those that I thought again was going to be a bigger problem <laughs> in life, like quicksand, because everybody does it. This is my favorite of yes. the Cullen buns on the shelf right now. Yes, and I after that first issue, I was like, okay, this is a concept where, unlike the other Cullen Bun books, this concept is so interesting that I'm willing to really give it a try. And this second issue, I'm in. And it's super fleshed out. Yes. In the sense of that <laughs> I said earlier, like he has so many ideas that like one of them or two of them are going to fall by the wayside and not get fully fleshed out. This is what he's like letting those other ones flesh like fall to the wayside for. This mm -hmm. is what he's fleshing out in that time period. Uh, Lucky Devil is it's another dark horse title for for Cullen Bunn and it's all about a guy who gets possessed by a demon and when he gets his exorcism the demon leaves but the powers of the demon don't and what he chooses to do with those powers has just been super interesting to watch unfold yes and he does kind of what you would expect anyone I think with demonic powers to do mm -hmm. and I kind of like <laughs> that in a very short span in this issue it's kind of like hey come on this journey with me and then two pages later you're like okay here's the journey we're in it this is it, it the only thing I would say about this book is it feels slightly rushed it does feel a little rushed but know? I think that is because you never know with Dark Horse if you're getting a full right is set of issues or if you're just getting four yeah, because uh, to me, I feel like this is maybe lining up to be just mm -hmm. a four-issue miniseries. Yeah. Although I think in the solicits, it doesn't say that it, it's a miniseries. No, and Dark Horse has been really good recently at putting like two of four or mm -hmm. one of two, but this doesn't say, and I think they might not have known when they initially pitched it, like where they were going to stop, but I do feel like it, it, it feels like it's going to be four or five issues at most. Yeah, and I... Honestly, depending on what he's able to do with this story, I would be down for it to go on longer. Mm -hmm. um, because I like this main character. Yeah. He's incredibly likable for a terrible person. Yes. And you, I feel like after the first issue, you know, because he was down on his luck and you're mm -hmm. like, oh, I feel bad for this guy. And I'm kind of rooting for him. And I feel like in this issue, you're like, okay, by the next issue, I'm going to hate this guy. Right. I'm going to hate this guy yeah. by the next issue. But you know what? So is everybody else. And yes. so we're going to still be on the same journey. Because yes. that's the thing that's been really good is we're on this journey with them. Like, we understood what it was like to be down on the luck in the way that he was. Like, your relationship didn't work out. Your job doesn't work out. Like, all of these things, like, piling up. Feeling like, you know, you get the coffee order for everybody and then everybody, like, doesn't give you the... Nobody pays you back. Mm -hmm. Like, you're like, oh, I got everybody's coffee. And then, like, oh, I got everybody's lunch oh I got this and it's like nobody ever pays you back like you just can't get ahead no matter what you do and then it's like now he's becoming this character that it's like okay I mean you get it like oh I'd do that too if I got those powers like I'd have that moment and then now you're like okay you need to slow it slow down a little bit buddy like and you're like you're getting you're going too far and so it does feel like you're seeing this entire character arc and it's it's his shit's gonna hit the fan really fast and Yes. Uh, I'm curious to see how bad that works out for him. Uh, it's not going to go well for him. I can tell you that. Mm -mm. This story is about to take a turn for the worse. Uh, but I think it's I think it's worth checking out. If there's if there's one Cullen Bun book that you're going to come in and check out, I think this is the one. It's yeah. only two issues in, so there's not a lot for you to pick up. But I think, especially out of his Dark Horse books, yeah, uh, this is the better That's choice of the two. Absolutely. For sure.
Yeah. Um, what the devil. <laughs> moving. I want to get it mad, I swear. <laughs> moving uh, from Cullen Bun. DC had two annuals this week that were really good, and I want to talk about both of them. Uh, the first was the Harley Quinn annual. This is Stephanie Phillips being amazing, as Stephanie Phillips always is. Uh, I was so excited that Stephanie Phillips was taking over Harley Quinn, and apparently so were all of you, because we immediately sold out of all the first couple issues of the Harley Quinn run by Stephanie Phillips. So guess what? I never got to read any of it. <laughs> so I've been waiting for the tr first trade to come out or something so that I could catch up. But I was like, hey, you know what? An annual. You can usually jump on an annual, and then you'll be able to keep going from there. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly the case. Like I, It told me everything about all the characters that I needed to know. And sets up, like it even says, this will be continued in issue 7 of Harley Quinn. So I'm like, hey, I'm back in the game. Um, <laughs> but Harley Quinn has been kidnapped and by a new villain named, Keep, uh, a villain named Keepsake that she doesn't know. And Keepsake, basically his thing is that he goes around and steals something from other villains. And then starts using it as his own because it's Keepsake. Um, and Harley Quinn's like clown buddy her one of her like little because you know harley quinn's taken in all the clowns and everybody mm -hmm. that used to work for joker one of her uh clowns uh, kevin has has no knows that she's gone missing and he's trying to save her so he's gone to like every villain in the rogues gallery and nobody has any information so he ends up at mr freeze's door and he's telling mr freeze the whole story about Har how harley got kidnapped and how we all got to where we are so he wraps up everything we needed to know and then brings us forward. And the whole time Mr. Freeze is like, make it a quick story. And Kevin's like, okay, so it started with, and he goes and, and he's like, that's not quick enough. And he like, give me the spark notes version. And he's like, and so you get this. It's great. Uh, you got that amazing outfit, by the way, that was just yeah. phenomenal Harley Quinn outfit that I was super excited about, but you get Mr. Freeze, you get Harley, you get a good story. Um, if you are, into Harley Quinn and you haven't been able to jump on the Stephanie Phillips title, this is a great one to do it in because you do get a lot of the, the Gotham rogues gallery. Um, and if you just are like, hey, I just want a fun story that stands on its own, this is it. You don't have to keep going. It wraps up completely as the annuals always do. It's a complete story, one shot. But if you want to keep going, you can keep going. I, I don't think he's still the artist, but Riley Rosmo was doing the art for that first volume. Uh, I think he's not doing it anymore. I think he's moved, uh, somebody else is doing it. Um, I'm a huge Riley Rossmo fan. He did the Martian Manhunter series uh, right before Harley Quinn, and he did Constantine. So I think it was just called the Hellblazer. The I think Hellblazer it was just called series. Hellblazer. Uh, I'm a huge fan of his art. Uh, I I do want to read Harley Quinn. It looks like he stops around issue five. So, yeah, probably yeah. the first trade. And then they've been rotating since then. Okay. So. I mean, based on my love for the Harley Quinn animated show on HBO Max, I do want to explore Harley Quinn. And I feel like Stephanie Phillips would be... The closest to what you want if you like the animated show. Okay. If you like the animated show, this is kind of where you want to go. Um, with Harley in the comics until the animated show comic comes out. This is honestly the closest. She actually does have a relationship with Ivy. She's not with the Joker. She's more confident in herself. You do get a lot of that fun stuff. If you're like, I want to keep going from there, the series right before that Sam Humphreys did is also really, really good. It's just a, it's a very really? long okay. series. Um, he had a great uh, Christmas issue. It was Harley Quinn. Uh, her mom had just passed away. She was dealing with that, and she was also dealing with, like, she didn't want to celebrate Christmas. She didn't want to celebrate Hanukkah because Harley Quinn's half Jewish. Uh, she didn't want to celebrate, like, either one, and she kind of ends up at this Christmas theme park, and she's like, oh, my God, this is the worst thing that could possibly happen. <laughs> um, but it's it's a lot of fun. There's also, like, a an, in the Sam Humphreys run, there's a time where she ends up in Apocalypse, and she becomes a female fury. So you wow. get a lot of crazy awesome things with that. Um this, again, closest comparison to the show, post-show. Sam Humphrey's probably closest comparison. Um, and, of course, you can never go wrong with um, Amanda and Jimmy's run on Harley right. Quinn. Totally fair. Because Harley Quinn, to me, was always kind of like Deadpool. In the sense that, like, you, you can insert her into any part yes. of the DC universe. And she just works it. Yeah, and it'll be enjoyable. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I'll have to check this one out. 
Um, Midnighter Annual. This is this is a standalone Midnighter story, which I hope leads to us getting a Midnighter story. Gosh, I hope so. Um, and I believe so. this one's Becky Clune and, and uh, Michael Conrad. Yes, with uh, Michael Oming art, which I am going to go ahead and say before we talk about this book, is the only negative thing. And it's not to say that I don't like Oming's art, because I'm actually reading uh, the Cave Carson book mm -hmm. from Young Animal that he did, and I love his art style, but it's not what I want for Midnighter. It's, there was times where, we actually talked about this in the store today, Josh was like, I just, some of this doesn't look like it fits. He was like, some of it's really good, and some of it doesn't look like it fits, and, and Matt was like, I like this guy's art, and I was like, yeah, the art itself is not bad, it just doesn't necessarily fit what's happening in the story. Right. And uh, it doesn't fit the vibe of Midnighter. Yeah. Who's very, you know, uh, he's been compared to the Punisher. Yeah. He's very violent, you know, and over the top. And this art style is not what I would expect from a from a Midnighter book. But I did enjoy the story. I think that Becky Cluden and Michael Conrad sit around in their house talking about comic book characters at all times <laughs> and they're like what if this character did this thing and then they're like no but then this would happen and it just keeps going back and forth and then one of them's like well I'm gonna go write that down and then suddenly they have a story because it seems like all of their stories seem like they've been talking about this forever of like this is what I would do if I wrote this character and then they kind of like flesh it out together right uh, I this definitely as a Midnighter fan this gives me everything I want from Midnighter, you get the time traveling and kind of the the multi versions of the character. But at the end of the day, no matter how many versions of Midnighter there is, they all love Apollo. They all love Apollo, which it is beautiful. Doesn't matter. And that is at the end of the day what I want in my books. I think there's a few like I've always enjoyed when the two of them are just kissing. Yeah. Because it's just like this is my favorite D C couple is Midnighter and Apollo. And I also like that they teamed up with uh, the newest uh, Mr. Miracle in this book. Yeah, that Shiloh was in it. And I wasn't sure at first because they brought up, like, they kept bringing up Mr. Miracle and they just kept calling him Mr. Miracle. Yeah. And finally they were like, Shiloh! And I was like, yay! Yeah, it is yeah, Shiloh! Yeah. I love that because I love Shiloh Norman's Mr. Miracle. Love him. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely curious. This book makes me want to kind of see more of him. Mm -hmm. Uh, but also more Midnighter. And maybe more Midnighter or Mr. Miracle team-ups. Yeah. As well. Would love that. Because uh, I, I liked their back and forth. Because mm -hmm. Midnighter is just going to do whatever he wants. He's only going to tell you half the plan. As you'll learn throughout this book, he does not always tell Communicate you well. everything that's going on. Uh, but he gets the job done. I like that that works so funny with Mr. Miracle because Mr. Miracle's like look I'm going to get out of this no matter what but you're going to screw over everybody else in the process. <laughs> yeah, He's yeah. like I'm Mr. Miracle like that's what I do I get out of things but like what about everybody else? And he's like, well, they'll figure it out. And he's like, I just I just don't know that they will. Like, Because he's like, we got to think about other ones. This is honestly the also the first time that Shiloh's Mr. Miracle felt like he could have been you know, Scott Free or any of those. Like, it felt, it was the most universal Shiloh's Mr. Miracles felt. In the other one, because we are so focused on who Shiloh is as a person and he's growing into that, he didn't really feel, he doesn't, he feels like an individual character that's, mm -hmm. like, doesn't necessarily, we don't see him a lot as Mr. Miracle in his current book. He's right. kind of, we're, because we're still learning who Shiloh is and he's still learning who mm -hmm. he is. And so this felt like, He's been doing this forever, and he's just the Mr. Miracle of his universe, and it works so well. And he has that Mr. Miracle-style banter and everything. So, right. And we know in in all cases of Mr. Miracle, that's an act. And we just haven't gotten to see Shiloh perform a lot in his current ongoing series, so or his current miniseries. So it was great to see him in that battle and have those Mr. Miracle-style quips and stuff. Yeah. I uh, This is definitely worth checking out. I mean, outside of the art, I think... Uh, as a, as a, like I said, as a Midnighter fan, you get everything that you need from a Midnighter book. Yeah. We were talking about how we love the art. You were since you just came back. We love the art. We love the artist and we love his art, but we don't necessarily think it fit the story. Um, and uh, next up, Tom Taylor has moved to Marvel uh, to do Dark Ages, which I'm gonna call Deceased with Marvel characters. Uh, if you've read Deceased, you will love this book. 
Uh, Gomez, as a huge fan of Deceased, if you didn't grab Dark Ages, I will put one in your box because this is very much like Deceased. I actually, when I, and when I read the first part, when I read this first issue, uh, Josh, who volunteers here all the time, um, if you've ever met him, his big thing is that he loves Marvel because they're very clear on their continuity at all times. It's like immediately established. And Josh said he read this and he was like, you have no idea where in continuity, if in continuity this falls, but it doesn't say that it's not continuity and it's so confusing. And he was like, I was like, I read it and I knew you were going to be stressed about it. And I love that you showed up and here you are. You're super stressed about this book. He's like, I'm so stressed about this. Like, why is this like this? Um, because you do, you open it up and you've got... You've got May with Peter and Mary Jane. You've got baby baby Spidey over here. And that's not a current continuity situation. But yet, then everything else is kind of current continuity. And so it's like, I don't know which Earth we're on in the multiverse. Um, but I will say, when I read Deceased, a lot of people I know fell off of Deceased very early on. Because they were like, it's just kind of like Marvel Zombies. It's just kind of... Like, oh, it's just like an action thing. And then Deceased ended up having some of the biggest heartfelt moments come out of that book. This is going to do the same thing. Tom Taylor is going to work in these heartfelt moments. They're all going to come. I don't know how they're going to come. I don't know when they're going to come. But Tom Taylor is going to find a way to rip your heart out on as many pages as he can. And he's already setting you up for that idea in this first issue even though he hasn't necessarily done it yet but he is definitely setting you up for the fact that he's planning it yeah i i get that vibe too my so i don't read a lot of marvel books and i don't read a lot of event books either um my biggest question is how in the hell did they not know about this guy it's true. I don't know. And I know we'll find that out because that's the same thing that happened in Deceased. It was like, oh, it suddenly happened and it was crazy and nobody knew how it happened. And then he unfolded it over the course of seven years. It wasn't really seven years, but it felt like right. that. But he unfolded all that information. So I feel like we'll find out a little bit more about why we don't know and how it happened or we won't. Because you could literally go in either direction. You could just be like, okay, well, that's not the point of the story anymore and move on. Or he could give us more. I don't know. Tom Taylor's usually good at catching his little plot holes and bringing them back later on. Okay. But when it comes to big events, a lot of times they do, like, wash over those big moments. So I don't know if we'll see that. But if you like Marvel Zombies, if you like Deceased, honestly, and you were like... If you read Deceased and you were like, man, this isn't Marvel Zombies. This is something kind of different, and I really just want to see something like this, but with characters in Marvel that I like, here it is, written by the same guy. <laughs> like, you literally get the book um, with the Marvel characters. So this is your chance to read Deceased, but with Marvel characters. Um, and I don't know where it's going to go, but if it goes in the same uh -huh. directions that Deceased did, you're going to, again, your heart's going to get ripped out, and you're uh, going to have to deal with it. It's not going to get any better. That was the thing about Deceased. Just like every time you thought like hope was there, Tom Taylor just crushed it out of your soul. Uh, I am on the fence about this one. Mm -hmm. uh, because I kind of wanted... I feel like they rushed... I felt like this was like one whole story condensed into this issue. And I know that it's just meant to set up the mm -hmm. actual story. But I kind of wanted more of this. Yeah. Where they're like, oh, hey, this is like a world ending mm -hmm. level event. And it's like one page, hey, this is happening. And then all of a sudden you get to the end of the issue and it's it's come and gone. And you're yeah. like, wait. Wait, what happened? Wait, hold on. I like this villain design. I want more of this. Please, can we stretch this out another four issues? And then maybe go into whatever's next. And I guess we'll see. I hope so. I I'll, I'll stick around, though. I'll stick around. Yeah. My one Marvel book. Right. There you go. Um, this is a wrap-up, another wrap-up from Aftershock. This is Miles to Go. This book has been one of the most delayed books. It has taken about a year and a half, maybe two years for this book to come out, and it's only a five-part series, so, like, the fact that each month, like, each issue ends up being, like, four months apart uh, I was watching the Aftershocks, like, weekly live stream, and they even said, they were like, we know, we know we took forever to get this book to you, but it's here now, and it's wonderful. 
Um, Miles to Go is all about a girl who all we know is that when she was a kid, she ended up basically her like neighborhood mentor was a guy who was an assassin and a spy and so she took really fondly to like learning to kill people from him and things like that and and now they the government has come for her and she is on the run with her daughter and she goes and connects with people who were connected to her father and the assassins and stuff because her father was an assassin and she's connecting with all these assassins that she's met in the past and they are on this mission and I will say this, this is one of the few Aftershock books that when you get to the end, they do leave a question mark. Uh, mm. So we may actually be getting a second volume of Miles to Go. And if you didn't check out volume one, honestly and truthfully, like when that trade comes out, grab it and read through it. Uh, we have all five issues in stock. It's really, really good. And now that they're all here and you're not going to have to wait the like who knows how long between issues, I definitely recommend it getting into this book uh issue five much like a lot of the aftershock series recently issue five is like hey by the way this universe is expansive and we never told you that um in the same way that like when you got to issue five if we live you were like oh this is never going to end <laughs> uh this kind of feels the same way and okay. i really hope that it does keep going because it's such a fun story but it also like all the stuff they added into the universe in this issue i cannot wait to see how that plays out uh, I need I need volume two to start immediately like let's just say I hope that's why it took forever for volume <laughs> one to come out it's because they were Hopefully. negotiating how to make a volume two yeah. and now that they've like figured it out they're gonna do it and I'm 100% going to be messaging like Ruth Ann from Aftershock and <laughs> asking her if she knows if that's the case because she even said like the end or is it the other day and I was like don't you tease me like that so <laughs> now I need to know is there a chance that we're getting another volume and how fast are you actually going to get it out because this book this series has been great um, we have all five issues like I said come check them out it's a, a lot of really cool story in it so miles to go miles to is go. worth all of those delays. It was worth all of the delays. I loved <laughs> it. Um, we had somebody come in who picked it up yesterday, and he was like, "I'm just so excited that it's finally here." And I was like, "Dude, I'm just so excited that you exist as another human <laughs> reading this book. Oh my god, I'm so happy to have somebody to talk to. Let's talk about issues one through four. I've already read five, so I'll try to keep it contained." <laughs> and he was like, "Okay." And so I was like, "I'm just happy to have a person that I can talk to about issues one through four because everything in that book is a spoiler. It's so hard to talk about because it does take so many turns." So quickly um but read it read it read it read it read it uh awa upshot has a new book this is called telepaths it's from j michael straczynski really confusing thing here because the art looks like it and it's j michael straczynski it is not a part of the resistance universe everything that looks Ooh. i know um, all of the J. Michael Straczynski books from AWA Upshot have been a part of the Resistance universe, the universe of superheroes that J. Michael Straczynski created. This is not, as far as we know, connected to that. Um, I could see J. Michael Straczynski having a magical way of working that on the back end, that we're missing all of that, but it does not in any way, shape, or form look like it connects to that. This is... Did you read this? I did not. Okay. There is um, some kind of crazy phenomenon that happens. Uh, they're talking about solar flares and things like that at the very beginning and how every time a solar flare happens, something crazy happens on Earth, whether that's tidal wave changes or um, they said that there was once a solar flare that happened and everybody that lived under power lines couldn't, ha like, had trouble breathing from then on out. Um, like if you live directly under it. And they kind of go through all the different things that have happened through solar flares. Um, and they're worried about one that is about to happen here. And, of course, we get a solar flare. And the book's called Telepath, so it's not a spoiler to tell you that suddenly people can read other people's minds. Not everybody. <laughs> uh, it's a select group of people. And it nobody understands why. And, like, the world's all kinds of, like, destroyed all different places and we see all of these different people um that's my favorite thing that i think j michael straczynski is doing with his awa upshot books is he's doing them very much like that 
um, the point of view like kind of movies where they they have like seven different main characters and they keep switching back and forth between the main characters and they're all kind of connected and it like leads to that little connections here and there but they're all also like doing different things so it's like classic good like you have a reason to hop from one story to one story to one story kind of thing this is one of those situations um and the people that get powers it works out and it doesn't work out for them. I actually was really hoping this was a part of the Resistance universe because I wanted to see more and more groups of people with powers and so I thought this was kind of like we're going to have moths and then we're going to have telepaths and then maybe he's going to put out something else. But it it does stand alone fine. It also could have it could again once it could easily become a part of that at any point in time. If they randomly decided tomorrow that this was a part of the Resistance universe and they stuck it in there somehow on the end back end, I would not be surprised. Um, but it does not. So for those who asked, because I know we had a couple people that were like, do I have to read all of the Resistance stuff to read Telepaths? No. It is not in that universe. You're good to go. Start here. Issue one of six. J. Michael Straczynski. Just doing his thing. I would hate to live in a world where everyone can read each other's minds. And he says that. He talks <laughs> okay. about, okay. in not in the comic, but in his letter in the back, he's like, what would happen? And he does, a, he makes a point of even using, like, politicians and stuff in there. And it's like, what would we do, honestly and truthfully? Like, yeah, maybe you don't really, like, you, you feel like you're an open book, but do you really want somebody to be able to hear everything that goes through your head? No. Like, no, nobody wants that. And he's like, yeah, here we are, like, in this world. And now we're suddenly there. I'm intrigued by the concept. It's a good sure. concept. Uh, again, like some of the AWA of shop books, I see this style art. And I'm immediately like, I'm not interested in this. But now that I'm seeing it's Steve Epp doing interior art, mm -hmm. I'm a little bit more... The interior art is definitely different than that ex that cover. And I think that helps. And, um, and yeah, and it's very heavy um, on story. And a lot of people are always like, oh, I don't know, like, if it's going to be... You know, when I see a lot of word bubbles, it kind of shuts me down. And I got into it, and I love when it's a lot of word bubbles. And I was like, oh, I don't know if this is going to keep going in the way I want it to with how much reading there is to it. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, no, all of these bubbles are important. They all matter. <laughs> I'm actually here for all of them. So, um, Telepath, check it out. Almost American. This is an Aftershock title from Ron Mars. I've never seen Ron Mars on a non-DC title before. Uh, it's weird. I know. But intriguing at the same time. So you told me an interesting thing you said that you think this is the same couple that the show the americans was based off of maybe because uh, i only saw a few episodes of the tv show and i remember it being a similar story but now i'm starting to think that that wasn't a couple that defected okay like they were russian they were spies so spied. just living in america got it Whereas this is Russian spies defecting, defecting to America. To. Uh, so I don't think it's the same story. Okay. And, yeah, this is exactly what that's about. It's about Russian spies defecting to America and um, trying to hide. One of the cool things that Aftershock does is Aftershock actually has a Russian spy, that like, former Russian spy that they use for this information. It The same person, like, kind of gave information for Red Atlantis that Stephanie Phillips did for Aftershock. Mm -hmm. Kind of helped with that. This... Um, the same person is there's a backup story from like just an actual like true stories from that person in the back of the book mm -hmm. talking about what it was like to be a Russian spy and for Matt he specifically names uh, Burn After Reading and how much yeah. Russian spies love Burn After Reading and how they think it is the most accurate yet comical spy movie that there actually is and i laughed when i saw that because i was like that's the one that's the one he went with yeah. oh my gosh i love it um yeah i did enjoy the just as much as i enjoyed this because i feel like you know this is a typical issue one you're mm -hmm. setting up the story but you're not really getting a whole bunch so it's kind of hard to tell if you're in or out on this first mm -hmm. issue but honestly, I think what sold me was the back of the book mm -hmm. uh, when the guy is talking about, like, his journey and how, you know, it ties into this story. Uh, 
and I'm I'm so in. Yeah, and it's based on a true couple that mm-hmm. actually moved here, mm-hmm. um, and defected. And I love the scene where they're like the American spies are like, well, we're not necessarily interested. Like, how do we know y'all are really who you say you are? And the Russians, instead of like arguing who they are. The guy just leans in and says, you know, if you'd stop messing with yeah. your wigs, it'd be less obvious that you were wearing one. Mm-hmm. And they just kind of sit up straight and it's like, no, these are the like masters of this craft. Right. Like they are, they know what they're doing and they are risking a lot to talk to you. And you get all of that, like just with that one little line about the wigs, you got all of that from it. So I can't wait. And it's Ron Mars. So it's going to be extremely real, well written. And mm-hmm. I'm going to be attached to everybody, and they're all going to, like, rip my heart out somehow by the end of this story. The thing, too, that I like about this story, because I do agree, yeah, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm definitely in on this one. The thing that I like is that the ties that they have to Russia isn't, like, straight up, like, James Bond-style no. spy stuff. It's, like, international money laundering. Yeah. And that's more intriguing to me than, like, your run-of-the-mill spy story. Yeah. So I kind of enjoy that that's the story that's being told. Because they're even like, can you tell us about operatives and this and that? And they're like, oh, no, that's not what we did. Yeah. And they're like, uh, aren't you spies? And they're like, that's not what all spies do. And yeah. you get, like, their whole backstory, and I think it's really cool. Uh, I definitely recommend if you have any interest at all, grab issue one and read it. You can come here and sit on the couch and read it off the shelf because you're going to find that this is a bigger story than you think it is, and it's definitely going to take some interesting turns for you. Yeah, also a lot of characters development in the first issue yes too. most definitely and it's based on a true story yeah which is even cooler yeah um all right so like here's some big books <laughs> we've been talking about for a while um it literally books we've been talking about for a while that was like our big new number one these are kind of books we've been seeing go on for a while wonder girl issue three finally out I have had people come in and ask me, where is issue five of Wonder Girl? And I'm like, issue five? They haven't even put out issue <laughs> yeah. three. It's been so delayed. Yeah. Here it is. Issue three of Wonder Girl. I just want to see Yada Floor. Five. They haven't even put out issue Oh, oh, that was weird. I just want to see Yada Floor uh, kick some ass already. Um, like, can we get there? Can we get to the part where Yada Floor becomes, like, this badass and kicks some ass? Because we're still kind of... I like her figuring out who she is, but she actually, and we see in this issue, she actually does know. We just don't know. Towards yeah. the end of this, she's like, no, I got this already. And I'm like, well, how, why do I have to go through all this trouble then? And the thing is, too, is, like, not only does she know who she is, but, like, everyone in the mascara and, also knows who she and is. And every other mythological world <laughs> yes. knows who she is. And I need them to, like... <laughs> I need this to happen already. And we've got, we're in issue three. She's on her way to Brazil. And we thought because she didn't know who she was and she was trying to go back and discover it. But as she's getting there, now we've got Eros in here, mm-hmm. um, which thank you, Wonder Woman writers, for always getting your Greek mythology correct and not being <laughs> like Cupid is here because it's not Cupid. Eros comes in and like they're they're here and he's he's doing all this stuff and um he always messes stuff up. Eros has never been like good at not messing stuff up, so I'm so glad that he comes in and he's messing the stuff up and I'm like, can you just stop with this mess that you're making? Um I like that with her because she is actually from like the Amazon. She's actually Brazilian, and, mm-hmm. and uh, we do see this like, and all of these all of these mythological backgrounds coming together, and they're like, this is a problem for all of us that she exists, and I like that. I like that we're getting little bits and pieces of mythology, and um, they're all kind of coming together because we are starting to see that mythology come back to play more and more in the Wonder Woman story. That's kind of been slipping over the years. Right. And so I like that now that it's back with Wonder Woman, it's also back with Wonder Girl. Yeah. I also enjoyed that you got uh, Cassie Wonder Girl Mm -hmm. and you also got Artemis Artemis. in here. Like, I'm... I kind of like them doing this, like, across the world chase of Yara Floor. And Mm -hmm. I'm excited to see when that all comes to a head and I honestly I kind of want this like all girl like Themyscira Amazon's team book 
Like, give me the Birds of Prey. With but just Amazonian. Yes. Yes. Because I already like the back and forth between Artemis and Cassie in this issue. And I feel like if you kind of bring in the badassness of Yara Floor into it, mm-hmm. then you could it would make for a really good team. I love that Cassie's an Artemis fangirl in yeah. this. Like, she's just like, oh my god, you're Artemis. You're like yeah. the coolest person ever. And Artemis is like, you're in my way. And she's like, okay, but... Seriously, yeah. can we just take a minute? And Cassie, of course, is still going by Wonder Girl, which I know a lot of people were like, oh, I don't want to read a Wonder Girl book that's not about Cassie. Like, Cassie is Wonder Girl. And I'm like, what about Don Troy? Um, but Cassie still has the Wonder Girl moniker throughout this book. She keeps introducing herself as Wonder mm-hmm. Girl. So I'm really curious how we're going to get to the point where Yada is is calling herself Wonder Girl and gets to that uh, situation right. because we don't know that yet and we know that in the future in future state she is Wonder Woman right but we haven't even gotten to the point where she's Wonder Girl yet so yeah. I'm just I'm really curious where it's going to go and honestly and truly as long as Joelle Jones is driving my ship I'm on it like I do think you know we don't need a love interest we didn't we need don't. a love interest we're kind of starting to see one develop in issues 2 and 3 but I think joelle jones might be pushing us away from that a little bit at the same time like she gave it to us and now she's like maybe we don't need that i don't know we don't need it wonder woman going on with becky clune and michael conrad right now has proven that like we do not need a love interest no um and we definitely don't need a steve trevor type character i'm hoping that we see this completely move away from that because i i read the first page of this one and i was like ooh, phil's gonna be mad with me because we don't need because Phil and I have uh, said I on so previous upset. readings that the one thing we didn't want for for Yada was a love interest and then they try to like force a love interest in this issue and we were like no but and the thing is too is like it's not even like I understand the Steve Trevor thing because it like it kind of evolves naturally in the most unnatural way you see my face is me not understanding Steve Trevor. So, like, but I understand how that relationship flourish flourished. Whereas this, it's just like, oh, he's my tour guide and now he's kissing me, but it's totally okay. I understand <laughs> like, that Steve Trevor relationship came because Wonder Woman came out 80 years ago and they thought that they needed to give a woman a man. But we're in 2021. Yada Floor don't need no man. And, yes, I 100% agree because in Future State... She's a total badass. She's a total badass. And we know at least in Future State she doesn't have a love interest. Right. So I'm like, good, you're not sticking around. At least I know that. You know, yes. I like prequels because I already know who's going to go away. <laughs> yes. Also, Arrow, stop fucking shit up. Um, that is my uh, ex- extreme mythological I commentary have, on Arrow. I have a feeling he's going to be around for a bit. Oh, he always is and he always messes stuff up. Yeah. But I also, you know... <laughs> what are you going to do? That's the way the mythology of, of the Greeks works. Um, in a twist of the people who do need a love interest, this is the most adorable rom-com of all time. This is Alice in Leatherland. I am a huge Alice in Wonderland fan. This is the story of a girl who writes modern, like she writes kids books. They're all fairy tales. And her partner breaks up with her. And her friend is like, who's a complete womanizer, she's like, hey, why don't you move to San Francisco where I live, where I'm going to be working on the books? And she's like, no, I could never do that. And then Alice is like, I have nothing else. Why don't I move to San Francisco? Shows up in San Francisco. Only place she can find to live is in a house full of dominatrixes. So, but Alice is super, like, conservative, like, she writes fairy tales, so she's like, oh, I have to fall in love with somebody before I ever talk to them about sex, and we should be happy, and, like, why can't Prince Charming, like, Princess Charming just sweep me off my feet, kind of thing, and Alice ends up living at these dominatrixes, she ends up, they give her, like, a, they help her get a job, and it's at a sex store, like, a sex toy store, and, like, she's, like, super embarrassed and can't do it, and the whole time she's writing her next kid book and every time she goes on a date or does anything like working in the sex store or anything like that she she translates it into kids book of a story of a late of a firefly that's trying to find its light and at the same time you get this these two girls who are constantly 
you got the like womanizer who's always like I don't want any strings attached and you got the girl who writes the fairy tales who just wants this perfect ending and they're constantly they've been friends forever and they're just like at each other's throats like every time it comes to like relationship drama for each other and it's literally just if you just made this into the most like a movie for Hallmark or Netflix it would be phenomenal because it's such a good romantic comedy that it, I need like the whole last half of this book is just the chase to like prove their love kind of thing and like running through the streets like trying to find like the perfect gift and like then running like tripping over cars and cars getting into accidents and like bike people being in your way like it's literally just a, a, a rom-com played out and it's weirdly from Black Mask yeah, I was just about to say, interesting. Not the publisher I would have thought would put mm -hmm. this out at all. Not the story I thought I was getting because it was pitched as Alice in Wonderland meets BDSM and there is not any of that in here at all. Um, it is just an a absolutely adorable romantic comedy about a girl. And, and as with all romantic comedies, this is a girl that's trying to find herself because she's always like identified in the wrong ways in her relationships and loses herself. So um, I recommend checking this out. I believe we have all five issues. If not, we'll definitely be getting trades if they make them because this series is so damn cute. Um, I even, that's exactly my tweet that I sent out about this. That was my official review of the book is so damn cute. And the <laughs> creator was like, thank you so much for reading. And I was like, thank you for making it. Like, yeah. are you kidding? Stop thanking me. Like I owe you a thanks. This was adorable always tops my list when it comes in as like the first book I read so it's the end this is all of it one through five we have it come read it it's great yes and even though it is cute and adorable it is definitely a mature title yes I can't not for show children. you the end of this book because of mature themes Facebook themes Facebook denied themes yes lastly the book Chad here you go here's your moment I will say book of the week the Mini Deaths of Layla Star, number five. The fifth and final issue. Uh, was it Chad who said that Ram V is... The writer of 2021? Yes. Yes. This is the reason why. Yes. This is... If you're going to... I told Chad yesterday, actually, that I think that um, Ram V will be the writer of 2022. Yes. Because this is the book that's going to make everybody start paying attention to Ram V. Right. And whatever he does next year. Um, this is the story of death. She, The Hindu goddess of death. She, They tell her that a young boy is going to be born who is going to find a cure for death. He's going to create immortality, essentially. And... Because of that, there's no reason to employ her as a goddess of death because death won't exist and won't be necessary. Mm -hmm. And so she ends up losing her job and becoming immortal. A mortal, not immortal. And she is absolutely furious about it and spends his whole life trying to kill him so that he will never create immortality. And it is the most beautifully written story yes. the way that Ramby told it it just goes to different points in in D uh, Darius's life it's it's not like it's linear but it's gaps between each thing and it's it's so beautiful I just I had a guy come in today and he said do you have issue three of Le Layla Star is the only one I'm missing do you have it and I said no because issue three was told from the point of view of the cigarette and I sold that book a as a standalone. Concept. Such, Such a, a great, great concept. concept. I sold it to so many people. I was like, you don't even have to read Layla Star. You just need to read this issue because mm -hmm. the way it's told, mm -hmm. you don't need to know what's going on. He's going to tell you enough of the story, and it's just a beautiful issue. It's so well done. If you gave Eisner's for single issues of a run, I would give an Eisner to that issue because it was so good. I mean, I would give an Eisner to this whole series. Yes. To be I'm entirely absolutely. honest with you. I mean... And it's, it will be nominated for a oh mini next year. I mean, I, I've i been enjoying this. Because I remember when the first issue came out, I was like, oh, this may be too heavy for me. Like, this may be too, right, you too sure deep of a concept. I read issue two. I was like, okay, well, if anything, I'm in for this art. And then, yes, like you, issue three, told from the perspective of a cigarette, I was like, this is brilliant. I don't, like, I will finish this. I will see this to the end. 
and it was worth it. I think the ending of this book is is amazing. It's phenomenal. I I cried. I actually I tweeted to Ram V that I was just sitting there in the store crying about the ending of Layla Star because it was so beautifully done. And I was like, I can't, I can't with this, this issue. And I had already told him that I didn't want the, what it to end because he, Ram V had tweeted when he finished the last issue and I was like, don't talk to me. Like, he's not talking to me, he's talking to Twitter. But I was like, don't you talk to me like that, Ram V. I don't want to hear about your last issues of Layla Star. Mm. And then, the same, it, and then it came, and I was like, you're right, I really did it, because it, it's so sad. It, it's not sad, it's beautiful. Yes. And the idea that that it's not about death, it's about the life you lived that matters, and the way he wraps this up, like, it was, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal issue and a phenomenal story, and we, uh, you need to read it. And whenever trades come out, we'll definitely have them. Like I said, I don't have copies of issue three. So I think I have one, two, four, and five. I don't have issue three. Um, but you definitely need to pick up this book and read it, whether it's in single issue form or trade. And every single copy of this book had a gorgeous, full-on mirror oh. foil cover yes, the that foil were phenomenal. Were great. They were fantastic foil covers, most definitely. Um, yeah, I highly recommend this. Uh, what I got into Ram V because of the Swamp Thing series he's doing. Um, I think he's probably written one of the oh, best. Swamp Thing is so good. Like the best Swamp Thing since Alan Moore's run. Like I would oh. put this right behind, not right behind, but I would put this behind Alan Moore's run in terms of of Swamp Thing runs. But this is like I I'm now on board for all things Ram V. Yes. Such a beautiful book. Uh, Philippe Andrade's art in this mm -hmm. book is breathtakingly fantastic. And because Chad and I said we're going to work really hard to clear this up for the rest of forever, Venom that starts soon is by Ram V and Al Ewing. It is not just an Al Ewing story. It is a Al Ewing and Ram V together writing the new Venom series. Really? Everybody is... Hmm. Everybody, because of the fact that Donnie went to Hulk and Al went to Venom, everybody's like, oh, they just swapped. But they keep missing the fact that Ram V is also on this Venom title. Hmm. So if you're, like, on the fence about whether or not you want to get the new Venom title, it's Al Ewing and Ram V. So it's going to have this massive continuity-style universe with some amazing heart and, like, lyrical almost writing. So get it, get it, get it, get it. Yes, I highly recommend. Like, top five lists at the end of the year, this will be this on will be a on. lot of people. This is going to be, be nominated for Best Limited Series at the Eisner's next year. Yes. Uh, and I know that because I'm going to nominate it for Best Limited Series at the Eisner's next year. So, anyway, let's give these people something because we talked a lot about a few books. Because I'm like, we don't have that many books, so I'm just going to keep talking. Surprise! Poster. It's a poster. Dun da 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 da. Poster. Poster. This is the Marvel Voices Legacy. This is actually the cover A of that book. He is so careful with these posters. You must love this. This is the AAPI Marvel Voices that just came out. This is actually the cover A as a poster, and you will get this poster. If you can tell me, in what issue of what comic did Wiccan and Hulkling share their first kiss? So if you can tell me what issue of what comic Wiccan and Hulkling first uh, kissed, you get this Marvel Voices poster. That's amazing. <coughs> Just that one. That was wrong. What would you think? Don't tell me what you think, because then they'll tell them. Was yeah. it at least the right book? Yeah, I okay. thought it was an earlier issue. Though. No, apparently, I don't know. That's what the internet has, con mm. that's what the Marvel so, wiki says. Smooth. Smoothing it out. There Can you, you see this poster, everybody? It's gorgeous. Dangerous. And again, if you saw Shang-Chi and you just joined us, please don't put your spoilers in the comments. Because I, uh, Phil has not seen it, and I'm sure other people haven't as well. If you have not seen Shang-Chi, get tickets. Go see it if you're okay with going to a movie theater right now. Um... If you want this poster, let us know in what issue did Wiccan and Hulkling share their first kiss officially. Where's Juan and all of this? I, uh, I don't know. This is an answer right, that Juan would know. Right, this is definitely an answer Juan would know. Um, 
Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. I'm like trying not to talk about Shang Chi like while I'm waiting for people to talk <laughs> because I'm like looking at this and I'm like, oh man, I have so many comments on Shang Chi based off of this picture alone. But I do like this poster because you get Jimmy Woo, you get uh, Kamala Khan, and you get Jubilee, Lee, and you get Silk. Like you get some good choices. But tell me what issue of what comic did Wiccan and Hulkling first kiss, and you get this poster? I will tell you. You can Google that. Uh, I am not going to know if you Googled it. So if you Google the answer, you get this poster absolutely free of charge. If you don't guess, by the time um, Phil's hands get tired, I'm going to keep this poster and I'm not going to feel bad about it at all. Uh, you, uh, you remember earlier when I talked about being fat? Wow, I'm already tired. <laughs> Phil's already tired. I'm you guys got like a Jeopardy sound effect <laughs> worth of um, in time to get that. Do we have a Jeopardy sound effect? That's licensed, isn't it? It's probably copyrighted. It's okay. I'm building my arm strength. Phil's building his arm strength. J2 just joined us. What up, J2? Read the question again for J2. Yeah, the que I did after J2 joined, but it is, in what issue did Wicked and Hulkling share their first kiss officially? If you know that answer, you get this poster. If you don't know that answer, I'm keeping this poster. It was not in a Young Avengers book, Renee. That was the best guess that you could make for yeah. somebody who does not <laughs> read Marvel. Yeah. Um, you know, Avengers is correct. But it is not Young Avengers. So that's your hint, everybody. And if you don't answer, you're just going to have to listen to Phil and I talk longer. It's like a threat now. Like, we will <laughs> talk about more comic books if you don't answer the question. <laughs> Matt, do you have any music at all that can, like, count down the amount of times that they have time that they have left to answer? What is, like, that intro music that you have? No? No? Matt? <laughs> There you go. That's your countdown music. When this ends, I'm moving on. All right. All right. <laughs> Nobody gets it. The answer to the question, just so you guys know, is actually Avengers Children's Crusade number nine. But since I am the only one who knew that answer, I'm keeping this poster for a later date. I'll probably give it away eventually, but I'm not giving it away today. There are more prizes to come. There are a lot of comic books to come as prizes. One that Phil and I are probably going to have to work really hard not to spoil for you when we get there. All right. Ready to go when you are? We're going to keep winding down our weekend with some in stocks. Phil got his workout in. All right. Thank you. Books that are, <laughs> books that are in stock. We've got, we only find them when they're dead. Speaking of Al Ewing, number eight. That came out this week. That came out this week. You can just pass that to Max because he's going to read it for the rest of the show. Simone DeMeo's art is gorgeous on that. We've Shit. got Worst Dudes number four in. I don't know. You work here. Um, <laughs> uh, Commanders in Crisis number 12, I believe. So we're about to get second volumes. We do have volume one of this, which we'll talk about later. This is a really cool story that we'll talk about when we get to trades. Captain Marvel number 32. This is the Miles Morales anniversary variant because we're on a 10 years of Miles Morales something like that yeah uh avengers we are in the middle of the winter she hulk storyline uh she hulk has been uh um uh, chad says matt keep up how am i supposed to talk to someone about we only find them if they're dead if you're not caught up so catch up matt um geiger issues let six. me know they come out hey you work here i'm not here on tuesday that's true <laughs> I'll let you know. Uh, magic issue six. This is Jed McKay telling a magic story. Chad, he's not. It's not that. He would still read it even being busy. I just didn't remember to tell him it was out. New Mutants number 21. Vida Ayala writing a great New Mutant story. Uh, Spawn 321. There is a Spawn book every week. It is not always a different Spawn universe book. No more black and white covers. No more black and white cover. No, no more of the sketch, sketch covers. Sketch. Yeah. Um, this is um, Spawn. Everybody asked me, like, oh, King Spawn came out last week. Does that mean Gunslinger's out this week? It's actually, like, King Spawn, Spawn, Gunslinger, Spawn. Like, it, it's it's a thing. And Gunslinger's next month. Ne yes. Comes in October. Um, uh, this is the new... Uh, this is a Dark Ages cover that got stuck on top of Spider-Man. Spider-Man Sinister War uh, issue 4 is out this... Or, that's all messed up. Anyway, Spider-Man was out again this week. It's all messed up. Just 
there's just there's always a Spider-Man book. Nick Spencer's <laughs> almost done. Um, Star Wars High Republic and High Republic Adventures both came out this week. High Republic Adventures is in the kids section. If you come to the store and you can't find High Republic Adventures, it's in the kids section. Go there. Slide whistle. <laughs> uh, Teen Titans Academy number six is out this week. Jenny Frizen made this beautiful Undiscovered Country yeah, cover. Uh, Static Issue 3 is out. This is one of those books that was delayed by DC. Everybody thought that it like was out last week. It's out this week. There's a lot more titles across the publishing industry. We're going to talk about that later in news um, to keep you updated. Uh, the Beauty is out. This is a sequel to previous The Beauty titles. Um, and it's one of those where you can kind of jump in if you've never read it and kind of learn a little bit more about a new world. Uh, you Promised Me Darkness is still going on. Uh, a lot of people dropped off because it's like that's one of those spec books that everybody grabbed in the first issue. Um, but the art is all like black and white and crazy mm -hmm. on the inside too. Uh, Heavy Metal has a new Tarna's title. Uh, this is a one shot. That's pretty much what most of the Tarna titles are. Money Shot is out this week. This is a vault title. We have some copies left. Uh, Jules Verne, The Lighthouse. This is a Jules Verne story that never got printed as a book. They adapted it to a comic book and that's how they put it on set. Uh, Bloom, what is this book about, Phil? I don't remember. But oh, this, died. yeah, the guy, yeah, he goes out into the woods with a girl to take photos for an album, it's not an album cover. He's doing it for something specific um, and they kind of do adult stuff together. She's a jungle girl. In the woods. Chad, if you want to give a description of what you think Bloom is about to help <laughs> fill out, that would be great. Chad, just drop in the comments what Bloom is actually about. Uh, Web of Spider-Man issue 4 is out. This is awesome. If you are a fan of Disney Parks, you need to read Web of Spider-Man to know about the upcoming Spider-Man ride that's a part of the new Avengers uh, area at Disneyland. If you are a fan of the kids of this, like the world, like you get your moon, your moon girl, and a lot of the other kids are going to be featured in this. It's a great adult and or kid title. Um, Hellions issue fifteen. Psylocke. I don't have to tell you that you love Hellions. I have Hellions. both covers. He has all of the Hellions <laughs> covers. I got both covers. I'm not even reading the book. <laughs> Batman Superman annual number uh, one. Well, it's two, the 2021 annual for Batman Superman is out. I just love Bat Batman Superman has some of the best covers for us. Uh, like you said, like series you're not reading that you want to buy all the covers. Batman Superman is, is one of the those. names on that book. Is that genuine Lang? Yeah. And Frank Avila did that cover. It looks like is he did he the doing interior. All the, in the interiors. Let's oh open that up. We're opening this up, guys. Are we going to be reading a Batman Superman annual? Oh, it is reversible. Oh. Come front, back. Oh, what? shit. Oh, my God. If you did not buy Batman I mean, Superman annual, num this is your, this is the book. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. This wow. is gorgeous. Yeah, you got that? Oh, my gosh. I'm like looking at it myself now. I'm like, I'm sure you guys needed to see this too. Oh, look at this. Oh, so it's it's half the book is one way and then the other half is the other way. Yeah, that's exactly the case. Uh-huh. Always a fan of uh, that style of comics. And to answer your question, yes, Jean Louis Yang wrote this annual and Frank Avila does the art and color on the inside. So, and of course, Frank Avila does variant because we can see that. Which, again, reversible cover. So if you want this, too bad, because this is now mine. <laughs> um, yeah. But seriously, I think we have more copies. Uh, love this. No wonder. I was wondering why I ordered so many copies of this annual. Now I know, because Frank Villa did the cover. And God, that's gorgeous. Sense. And the interior art. I'm, anytime Frank Villa does something. Uh, also, Chad said, in regards to Bloom, it is a late 60s comic book artist looking for a muse, meets a, meets a dancer, and things get psychedelic AF. Yeah, that's what I said, right? Yeah, that's sort of what you said. Uh, Infinite Frontier number five is out this week. Uh, I know a lot of people are following along with that. I'm learning new things about Infinite Frontier every time it comes out. And lastly, there is a facsimile edition of Ultimate Fallout 4 that dropped oh, this man. week. What are the eBay prices on this one right now? You can't tell the difference. Between you that cannot movie. tell the difference. Uh, except for the price point, right? Nope. No, the original was three ninety nine too. Nuh-uh. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Get out. It might have been two ninety nine. I don't know. That might have been two ninety nine at the time. But you can't tell the difference at all between the facsimile and the original. It's crazy. I want to know as, how even as the one 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 on the barcode. I want to know how many people have been gypped on eBay because of this book. It because it doesn't. Like, this, yep. We, we Bob says barcode and the Marvel logo make it so hard to tell. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Like, why? Why would you not put anywhere like facsimile edition? Because facsimile, it's reprint. Yeah, uh, but maybe say it somewhere. So even they said in the, barcode. the barcodes. Uh, the barcodes are different. And Renee said the Marvel logo is black in the original one and red on this one, and that's the only difference. Okay, but if you're scrolling through eBay, right, you're not going to notice. That. What are the odds that you are going to be paying attention to that? And that's the thing. Even the actual facsimile edition of AF15, we used to have it like on our wall when we we had the facsimile wall when we first opened that had all the facsimiles on it. And people would always come in and be like, "Oh my God, you just have an AF15 on your wall." <laughs> just we're like, out. "No, it's a, it's a, it's a facsimile. See, it says 3.99 on it." But so many people were like, "Oh man, how much is that AF15?" And they would freak out when they would see it. So this one being even closer is gonna definitely be a thing. But if you're like, "Hey, I've never read Ultimate Fallout 4, and I just want to read it," get it, read it, and then put it back in the bag and board because fac facsimile editions from Marvel. Skyrocket in prices too over time. This will definitely be one. Yeah, I, I I guarantee if you eBay this book right now, it'll, it's be, still it'll be worth more than cover price Absolutely. already. Absolutely. Uh, also, a uh, little PSA here: uh, don't drunkenly uh, go on eBay and make offers on everything. Fuck I've you. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, are you talking about yourself or Matt? Because. <laughs> Ser seriously, though. <laughs> What'd you buy? I didn't buy anything because I don't drink, but I just... <laughs> I, I do go on eBay and make a lot of offers, and then I go out and I tell some of my friends in the comic community, and they're like, oh, yeah, try doing it drunk when you wake up the next morning and you have, like, 11 accepted offers, and you're like, oh... Cause I'll do it sober. Are you and gonna call Matt out like that on the on live television? That is why I moved into this seat <laughs> <laughs> for all the times that Matt that. is talk shit about DC Comics. Now it is my turn <laughs> to talk shit about Matt. Apparently, <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. I love it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That I'll just roast me one of these live streams. I'd love it. We would too. <laughs> uh, well, like, we might have a panel for that. Do you want yeah, like a whole a panel? Table. Oh my gosh! That I will. I will. Control. All right, I'll be the host, and then we'll get like everybody to come in. The volunteer staff of Bat City will do the roast of Matt live. <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm gonna send that message out, and everybody is gonna be like, "When do we do this?" Like, yes, I'm so ready. And Don't it's gonna mean. be wonderful. Be a little mean. Don't be too a little mean, mean, not too mean, yeah. but like kind of mean. But like kind of. It's mean. gonna be great. Bob said facsimiles are great to put up on a wall because they're cheaper or posters or than posters or art, and that is so true. Um, let's give them a prize. Can we do a giveaway? We ran through that. One. <gasps> prize! Right. Hey, we got Phil at least to do the hand, so we're He's moving it up. So and. I've got <laughs> I've got two books for you this time. Uh, this is the most recent Silk series. This is Ooh. number one. Ooh. And are you ready nice. for this, Phil? Not only do you get that, but you also get Dead Dog's Bite number one, which is one of mine and Phil's favorite series. This is actually yes. the book that made me want to put Phil on the live stream with me every week because had Phil been on the live stream every week when this came out, y'all would have been listening to us talk <laughs> for four hours a week every yeah. week. Oh, we wouldn't have talked about any other book. Any other book. Narrator. Um, uh, Dude, I uh, want to cosplay as him so bad just because it's easy. I need you to do that. It'd just be the easiest cosplay ever. The only prerequisite for getting this prize is you have to talk to Phil and I about Dead Dog's Bite for the yes. rest of your also, life. Also, will you please tell uh, Dark Horse that there needs to be merchandise for this? Yes. Either a pin or a button of some sort <laughs> for the peppermint. Yes! Okay, you can get both of these books, and Phil and I will keep talking about why we love Dead Doug's Bite. Um, if you can tell me, and I feel like this price is going to chat automatically, because in 2006, 
or 2007, depending on where you look it up, because sometimes they go off the top, the start date, sometimes they go off the end. But in 2006 to 2007, Oni Press published Colin Bunn's first noir horror comic. What was it? It's none of the five that we talked about today. <laughs> um, but in Oni Press published Colin Bunn's first noir horror comic, what was it? If you can tell me that you get both of these books while you're Googling that, because you probably are. Um, Phil and I love Dead Dogs Bite. <laughs> It's yes. it's one of my favorite series that mini series that came out this week. Whoa, Chad, chill out. No, you that's not the one. <laughs> that is not the first one. Something came before that from Oni Press, before Six Gun. It's before oh, Six Gun. Chad, stop being cocky. You got it wrong. <laughs> Who needs Google? Something came before Six Gun. <laughs> <laughs> Chad's laughing too. Uh, Six Gun is a great book, by the way. I highly right. recommend it. It is one of my all-time favorite comic book series. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Renee, Renee the Fifth Gun. <laughs> oh my gosh, you oh guys! Oh god! Oh my gosh! You can't tell great jokes when we've had this much wine. What are you talking about? This is like, you know. Uh, there is a, another noir horror comic that came out from Cullen Bunn in 2006 from Oni Press. Uh, if you can look it up, you can actually just go to Cullen Bunn's Wikipedia and look at the book that came first from Oni Press, and that will give you the answer. Um, that's all you have oh to do, and gosh. you get both of these books. You get the joy of reading Dead Dog's Bite number one, and that is a prize that I cannot, I cannot wait enough. Um... So, you can uh, give me your answer. Ram, you are lucky because Silk Number 1 is a great story. Uh, this this Silk series was really good, this miniseries. I do want to read this Silk series because I love the character design. And uh, I, I definitely, I definitely want to check Silk out. <laughs> so, Chad, answer this so I can have this Silk book and then you can have Dead Dog's Bite. Or Ram can answer it because he already has oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Silk. So, Ram, if you want to answer, Phil will gladly take the Silk number one off your hand. All you have to do, again, I'm giving you where to find it. Go to Cullen Bunn's Wikipedia. You can look at his works on uh, on Oni Press. And if you can tell me the book that he published in Oni Press in 2006. It was listed, if you read his biography, it's listed as his first noir horror comic. What was it called? Not Harrow County. Harrow County came a little bit later. Chad, I was totally setting you up because we did have a six-gun conversation the other day. Really? I wish I would have been here for that. I know. You should have been here for that. It was yesterday. Oh, man. You were... Nope. Friday. Friday. It was Friday. Oh, you were at work. Mind. Yeah, it would have been at um, work. Yeah. If you can tell me the answer to this question. 2006, <laughs> Oni Press published Colin Bunn's first noir. It might be listed as 2007, except it actually technically came out in 2006. Rogue Planet was only like a couple years ago, wasn't it? Um, Chad, just Google it. I know. I'm like, I'm going to Google it and answer the question in a second, but I have the answer right here. So, it's like the only one. And again, I feel like this was another pretty decent Cullen Bunn book. I read it. Oh, there we go, Chad. There we go. Exactly. There you go, Chad. Yes. It was there. You, I know, Chad's like, oh, he got it. All right, got Chad. It. Yes, it Chad is the it. damned. <laughs> Uh, Chad, yeah. I need you to read. <laughs> Chad, he only wants silk. I need you to read Dead Dog's Bite. We're, that is a requirement. We are forcing Dead Dog's Bite onto you by giving it to you. And honestly, if you come yeah. up here and want to read issue one, uh, we'll let you also read issues two through four as well. That's true. Because I just want everyone to read this book. I know. Me too. I still haven't heard anything about trades for it. Speaking of <laughs> trades. Woohoo! He doesn't get a sound effect other oh. than the, the spin. Trades. Oh, now he's happy to do the thing. <laughs> um, well, you'll do the prizes and I'll do trades. Okay, sure. Trades that are out. Uh, Space Bastards Volume 1 is finally out. This is so thick. How many issues is in this? I think it's only six, isn't it? Five, I six? would think so. It doesn't say. Um, They're on issue eight. Seven or eight just came out not too long ago. So it at least has to be the first six. It's got to be the first. I mean, I, it's got to be just because it's so thick, but it doesn't say, and I don't 
Right, you look at it. You figure it out. Um, if you don't know Space Bastards, Space Bastards is all about a world where the Postal Service is now run by bounty hunters, and the more times a package changes hands, the more money the person who delivers the package gets. So it's ridiculous, and it just gets like more and more outlandish on how like package deliveries go. Um, Phil is looking at... I think it's one through uh, one through six. One through six. So if you want the first six issues of that series, this is great. This is a really good way to, to just get all of that story because it kind of unfolds throughout the six issues, so it's a good way to get it. Yes, the publisher. Oh, Humanoids. Humanoids, yeah. It's um, a great book. House of X, Powers of X. This is everything you need to know for House of X, Powers of X. It's all here. People ask me all the time for that. It's finally back in stock. Uh, we talked about New Mutants having a new issue today. This is volume one of the current ongoing New Mutants. And it is, um, oh, this is this is New Mutants 14 through 18, but it's volume one. That's weird. Sure. Okay. It's Vida Ayala's New Mutants. Uh, Two Moons volume one has a trade now. This is a great story about the Civil War and a, a Native American man who starts to see demons through the Battle of the Civil War. Um, it's crazy. Really good. Uh, Invincible has a volume one. Everybody always asks me if I want to read more about Invincible after watching the show. Where can I start? This is a great one because it's an inexpensive way to jump into Invincible. Nine ninety nine. Mm hmm. Uh, Eternals. This is Kieran Gillen's current ongoing Eternals series. Just came out this. Just week. came out this week. It's issues one through. Six. Yeah, one through six of Kieran Gillen's Eternals, which is great because that is another one of those series that kept getting delayed and it took forever for it to come out, but now you can jump in and get it all at one time. A right, perfect timing. And if you are looking to get into Invincible, or Invincible, and Eternals, here is Neil uh, Gaiman's Eternals run. So a great way to... The previous one. Yes, supposedly this is where the movie's more based on this versus the Kirby stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, as much as I love Kirby Eternals, this Neil Gaiman run is also really good. Yes. I enjoyed it a lot. Right, so if you want to get into it before the movie, read this volume. Uh, since Tom Taylor is writing Deceased for Marvel Now with Dark Ages, here's some Deceased for you, actually just Deceased. This is... Uh, the DC run, this is the initial run, 1 through 6 of Deceased, and then we also have the Unkillables, which kind of gives you an update on what the villains were doing during all of that. Ooh, uh, this is the one I was told to read because of Deathstroke's in it. This is a Deathstroke-led team. Uh, if you're enjoying the What If show, here is the What If classic, uh, kind of an epic collection of What Ifs from Marvel. What did you say? We also have volume three. We also have volume three. This is Resistance. This is J. Michael Straczynski's launching point for all of the AWA uh, connected universe. Like I said, Telepass isn't necessarily a part of that, but if you want to get into it, all AWA Upshot trades are $9.99, so any of them you want to pick up, you're going to get some great stuff. Commanders in Crisis it was out this week. This is volume one of that from Steve Orlando. This is Actually, another story that was originally intended for DC, but ended up going to an indie comic publisher. I haven't read it. It's all about, it's really cool, because it's all the minority presidents. Uh, the first minority president on each er, planet Earth in every universe gets pulled to the last remaining Earth in the multiverse, and uh, they have to save empathy from being destroyed, and the emotion of empathy is put into a human, and the human is shot in issue one. And okay. it's like, oh, well, now empathy is gone, and how do we fix it? Because this is the last planet left in the multiverse. Like, this is the last Earth left in the multiverse, and if we don't fix it, we've got nothing. Interesting. Uh, lastly is Blue and Green. This is a Ram B book that came out um, prior to this year that a lot of people haven't had the chance to check out yet. This is all about um, a guy who comes back home after, I believe it's the, his mother's funeral, and he finds a random photograph of a jazz musician and he ends up on a hunt to try to figure out more about this jazz musician and Ram V story unfolds. It's a great book too. Yeah. I think if you like Ram V this is definitely something worth checking out. Absolutely. Um, I know Chad's going to jump in because he absolutely loved this book as well. So Yeah also just to show you a little bit of this art as well uh, a non RK is the artist. Great artist. Uh, Adita Bideker is on this book as well. 
Eisner nominated mm-hmm. Adita Whitaker. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I highly recommend checking this one out. Also, I, I really love this cover. It's got like this little kind of shiny foil aspect going on. Tilt it back. Tilt it back. There you go. Keep going. Chad says it's incredible and emotional story. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, I think this is packaged really well, and it, you're getting your money's worth with mm-hmm. this story, most definitely. Yeah. <clears throat> cool. All right, well, let's try to give them something else. Let's see where we are on these giveaways. <laughs> Prize! I've got two books for you right now. I've got Year Zero, Volume 2, Issue 1. And from AWA Upshot and Milestone Returns. This is kind of the lead into how all of the Milestone characters return to the DC Universe. It's a great way to just kind of figure out what's going on with Static, uh, Icon and Rocket, Hardware, all of the Milestone characters. And you get this book, both of these books, if you can tell me what is Static's actual real name. If you can tell me Static... Static Shock, whatever you want to call him. His name is Static as a superhero. If you can tell me what Static's real name is, you can, and I need the whole thing, uh, first, middle, last, because that's how he goes by. Um, if you can tell me that, you get both of these books. It's Will Smith's kid. No. Neither. <laughs> I just remember there was a rumor that there he was, was going to play. There was a rumor that, yeah, that Jaden was going to play him. Static. Yeah, I mean, he would have done a good job. Oh, he been so great. He would have been great. <laughs> Chad says I'm not answering all of these yes I know Chad these are all very Chad oriented questions tonight uh, not trying to stack it in your favor so I appreciate you not answering all of the questions that you would normally know the answer to but if you can give me Static's real name his non superhero name you get both of these books free comics man even if you've already read them you can hand them off to somebody else. It's a free copy of a comic. Uh, the cool thing about Year Zero is it is a, a zombie book, and you can kind of jump in any like you can jump in at this volume too, and you're not going to be lost. Um, and the Milestone book is a setup for all these new characters, so it is a standalone one shot about Milestone characters. So both of these books are really great to just jump in on right now. Um, and you get both of these prizes if you can just tell me Static's name. Yes, Ram, Virgil Ovid Hawkins. So these milestone books have been really great so far. Yeah, they have. If you're going to start anywhere, I'd say Icon and Rocket is probably the best of them so far. And I also really enjoy Hardware as well. And I really enjoyed Static. They <coughs> modernized Static Story to uh, give him his powers at the marches that took place last year. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. It's been so good. So if you haven't read the new Static, jump in on it. Um, and honestly, like, while you're at it, if you're reading all the Milestone comics, just grab the new Mr. Miracle because Shiloh's story fits in with that universe so well. Um, comic industry news. Um, Ram gave us some great news. Uh, September 5th is the anniversary of the premiere of Batman the Animated Series. It premiered on television 29 years ago today. And ironically, it is also Michael Keaton's birthday. So, uh, great day for Batman. There is also a Batman the Animated Series uh, documentary that premiered on YouTube today that was done by an Austin artist and filmmaker um, named Phil Maki. He did uh, a great Batman the Animated Series documentary. It's got, like, all of the people who worked on the show, like, a part of it. Um, It kind of goes, like, through all of the key episodes and stuff. It's on YouTube right now, so if you want to stream that, you can actually just check out Stay Tuned batman the animated series and if you just type in stay tuned batman the animated series it'll come up and you can check out this uh great documentary documentary made by an austin local um which is super cool to see that get made Hmm. yeah i got to see a bit some pieces of it earlier here in the shop it's pretty cool yeah it's pretty cool we we yeah we played it twice today in the shop um and then uh other industry news i mentioned earlier that Um, We're getting a lot of people coming in asking where titles are, and and they're like, it said it was coming out this week. There is an industry-wide delay on all titles. It's not consistent. Like, some titles are still coming out on their schedule. Some titles are getting delayed. Um, There's just been, there's been paper shortages. There's been printing delays. There's just been all kinds of stuff. Every publisher has some. The problem is, is that none of the external facing updates are getting put out 
So Previews World is run by Diamond. So if you do Previews Catalogs, or if you go to PreviewsWorld.com, which is where everybody gets their information from to aggregate to their individual blog listings and things like that, um, that's not getting updated. And so people aren't actually seeing that those updates are happening. I actually had somebody come in and ask me when a Scout book was coming out, and Diamond still had it listed as this week. But Scout is also shipping through Lunar now. So I looked in Lunar because they just uploaded all of their dates, and it's actually like a whole month away. And so I was like, they just haven't updated. Like a lot of the Diamond dates haven't been updated because they they're just letting us know in emails like oh these are delayed and so it's not getting out to the external world so if you come in and a title's not there or if you go to any comic shop and a title's not there ask somebody um, and have them look it up because a lot of these things are getting delayed and they should have that information but also just be kind to your local comic shop be kind to creators um, it's definitely not either of their people like either of those people's fault your local comic shop and the creators have zero control in some cases the publishers don't even have control um there was a book recently that everybody was getting mad at i think it was aftershock because it wasn't out and they were like what do you mean it's not out we were told it's coming out this week and it actually just like got delayed and they didn't even they hadn't even gotten the information yet so just understand it's an industry-wide thing tiles at random are kind of getting hit by it so if you come into a shop and you don't see a book ask your local comic shop hopefully whatever your lcs is they can tell you whether or not a book is delayed um if they don't know and they're like maybe it was delayed just know it probably was the case um because they at least know whether or not it came in that week um and if it didn't come in that week it's definitely a delay that may or may not be something that they can handle. Um, it's definitely not something we can handle, but uh, we're working, we are working, creators are working, we're all working as best as we can to get the books that you wanna read out to you as fast as they are available to us. So just know that unfortunately there are a lot of industry delays and there might be some books that get pushed back a week, a month, whatever, but your books are coming. We'll let you know if there aren't. They aren't really. If they get canceled, we'll tell you. Also, if you're waiting for a book that got delayed, it gives you a chance to check out all the wonderful trades we've shown you, as well as digging into some series that we've shown off tonight. Absolutely. So there's always going to be books available for you to purchase, whether it's the book you've been waiting for or not. Yeah. And yeah, uh, Bob says there's really a shortage on supplies. Supplies. There was, there is um, a shortage on all kinds of supplies. Uh, for BCW... Um, and all of the like my lights and all the people like that who make supplies last year when everybody went into those those lockdown moments and things like that um, people started thinking like well I'm stuck at home I'm gonna just organize my my collections and they uh, they started organizing their collections and they started calling like stores and ordering off Amazon and things like that all of the supplies BCW and other companies like them were not prepared for that. They had no, obviously none of us had any idea that COVID was gonna happen, but they weren't prepared for that. And now since then, cardboard, plastic, um, everything, paper, they're all aluminum, glass, every kind of manufactured thing has had a lot of slowdowns. A lot of it being because, you know, it, the areas, the factories have been just shut down. Um, so many factories are still having problems because there are so many people working close together that they keep getting, they don't have enough employees to come back and work. Um, BCW for regular, just like bags, the bags that bags and boards go in, like if you want to order Silver Age bags for your bags and boards, it's generally speaking about six months to a year for waiting on the next time that might come available and it's then got a hit across all of the industry um so it's there's not a lot i know bcw bags just like one package of bags for silver age comics on amazon goes for 40 dollars right oh now gosh. it's insane um so the same with uh short boxes all of that they're all um really just there's just so many problems with getting all of those supplies made so it's kind of at the mercy of the companies that did already have it made um, and what they're doing with it. That said, we do have five new 
graphic comic boxes in stock. Uh, this is the <laughs> way too close. Um, this is the Batman one. We also have. Oh my god, that looks so funny on the shot. Uh, this is a Batman one. We also have a X Men one. That's an Alex Ross X Men. Uh, Michael Cho Web Warriors box. A Kingdom Come box. And the other one that I already forgot. Deadpool. Deadpool. We also have a Deadpool box. We have five new styles of graphic comic boxes back in stock at the store. These are all $12.99. So um, if you're looking for a short box, you need something. We do have these graphic ones in stock. Other than that, the honestly, the only other boxes we have is we have the graded comic book plastic BCW bins in stock. Um, but it is, there is a lot of shortages going on on supplies right now. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Chad said, I've never seen a short box look so massive like a kaiju in frame. <laughs> Sorry, I put it right up against the camera because that's where there was open space without knocking anything down. So, um, yeah, if you're looking for some short boxes, let us know. Hit us up. Um, they will go fast. I will tell you that because of the fact that supplies are short out there. It is hard to find, so they will go fast. What are the price on these? Twelve ninety nine. There you go. All that you can eat for oh no. um, So that's all the uh the only other comic industry news I have is even we're always closed on Monday, so don't forget we're not open tomorrow. I know it's Labor Day and everybody keeps asking if we're open on Labor Day. We're always closed on Mondays. That said, the exception to every rule exists. Next Monday, September thirteenth, from seven to nine. The amazing people from Literati Press will be out here for an ink and draw event. Um, that is, they are going to have some of their comic artists as well as some of their teachers out on site to not only help like come up with some fun, like I think we're going to play like some Pictionary style games and other fun art style games and art activities, but they are also going to be looking at per portfolios. So if you are a comic artist and you've ever been like, I'd love to write or I'd love to draw comics for uh, and break into that. This is a great opportunity to do that because they are going to be looking at portfolios to kind of give you some tips and tricks for how to make your portfolio stronger. And who knows, that could lead to working with Literati Press, who are the people behind Glamorella's Daughter, uh, Blackjack Demon, and We Promised Utopia, three books that just came out this year. And they've had a lot of other books in the past, but um, they did just recently come here for a signing for Glamorella's Daughter, and we're happy to welcome them back. They will be here September 13th from 7 to 9. It is an event in the backyard of Bat City. Masks are required. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, come out and learn some drawing techniques, but also just hang out with some really cool creators as they tell you what they're tips and tricks are yes also support literati press it's a lot so of very talented people a lot of very talented people they are very big on they support the same mission that we do of helping kids learn to read write and explore their art but they also want to they extend that into the adult world a lot and create that and i've had a lot of people ask me when are we going to have um, adult comic creation workshops those will come soon they will cost money this one is free so come check it out that's all I got. Let's do a giveaway. I totally forgot that we had one more. Prize! Oh. Lastly, I have for you issue one of Jules Verne's Lighthouse. And are you ready for this? I don't think they're ready for this. Okay. I've got a copy of issue one of Crossover, and I'm just going to give it to you. Dang. So that's happening. Also, if you want a copy of Megan Hutchison Kate's crossover variant, I need to know before noon tomorrow. Cover B of crossover on tomorrow's FOC is a tarot card variant done by Megan Hutchison Cates. If you want that, you must message me by noon tomorrow or you are not guaranteed to get it. You're not guaranteed to get it either. We're only ordering it for subscribers. I'm ordering it for the people who asked me. That's what I got. So if you want one, let me know. Phil, I saw your hand raised. Chad, I saw your hand raised. Uh, I mean, I'm already subscribing to the title, so I assume I would get one. I'm honestly probably only ordering cover B. Just in case. <laughs> um, but that said, 
Megan's, I've had like four people message me, is this an actual variant or is this an incentive variant? It's a cover B. You can get it. It's open order. Let me know. You're not getting it if you necessarily if you don't order. Um, the question you have to answer for this is, J. Michael Straczynski is known for his work on Babylon 5. But if you want these, I'm going to need you to name three cartoons he worked on in the 80s. You get both of these books if you can tell me three cartoons J. Michael Straczynski worked on in the 80s. Again, Wikipedia is your friend. While you're looking that up, I'm going to tell you books out this week. Comics out this week are Infinite Frontier number six, Swamp Thing number seven. Green Lantern's annual is out this week as is Green Lantern number six. The Me You Love in the Dark number two is finally out. I'm so excited. Defenders number two, Blue and Gold number two for all you Booster Gold fans. For the Bat Fam, Nice Talents on the Lake is out this, number four is out this week. Shang-Chi number four is out. Daredevil 34, Eve number five. Woohoo! I've been waiting forever. Canto, Lionhearted number three. Witchblood number six. Corset number one, which is a new title from Scout, as well as Impossible Jones number one from Scout, and Not All Robots number two from AWA Upshot, which is a Mark Russell title that you should definitely be checking out. In the meantime, if you want to win these prizes, you must tell me three cartoons that J. Michael Straczynski worked on in the 80s. If you go to his Wikipedia, you can literally just scroll down to TV and it'll tell you all the animated series he worked on. I'm making it super easy for you because it's the end of the night and I want to give you these books because everybody should be reading Crossover. Also, uh, Shannon asked me earlier before the live stream if there was one book that I would recommend. I don't even know if it's on the wall anymore, but uh, The Me You Love in the Dark. It's not because we're sold out. <sighs> then never mind. The only copies we have are Megan Hutchison Kate's <laughs> 616 variants uh, that are Scream Homage covers. So if you would like, Matt's going to run and grab them right now. If you are like, man, I really do need to read that The Me You Love in the Dark. Or if you're like, I maybe I should collect it because it's sold out everywhere. Or if you're like, hey, Megan Hutchinson Cates is just the best human on the planet, which you are correct in thinking that, you will know that she's got this amazing 616 variant. This is the regular, and that is the variant of it. And then we also just got in her Joker puzzle box, which this is the regular, and once again, the variant is the black, white, and red. If you don't know 616 variants, they're uh, always... They always have a store mm -hmm. variant that's colored and then a store variant that's black, white, and red. So, um, yeah, these are gorgeous, awesome. Um, I absolutely love these six uh, these uh, Scream variants. Everybody keeps coming in and go going, is that a Scream homage? And I'm like, yeah, and they're like, what book is that? I'm like, the best book. <laughs> it's the me you love in the dark. It's Scotty Young and Jorge Corona writing a, a book about a haunted house. Like, what more do you need? Oh, you needed a Megan Hutchison Kate's variant? <laughs> well, yeah. there it is. There it is. Yeah. Not not even... That's not even, like, me being biased because I think Megan is the, the best. Also, shout out to Megan because she sent me an entire case of Topo Chico. There you go. So, shout out to, to Megan. I love you. She sent me an entire case of Topo... Matt called me the other day and said, there's somebody here is delivering a case of Topo Chico. Do you know what that's about? And I was like, Megan! <laughs> like, I love it. She's the best. Um, so, I love you, Megan. Thanks for the topo. Uh, and once again, you can get this copy of Crossover Number 1 and the other book that was in there that I... Oh, Lighthouse, The Lighthouse. If you can tell me some cartoons that oh uh, J. Michael Straczynski is known for his work uh, on in the 80s. And the fact that no... I heard that. Stream resumed. Woohoo! Um, if you answer that question in the meantime, I don't know. So, sorry for the delay and the pause. We are back. The question is, once again, J. Michael Straczynski is known for his work on Babylon 5, but he also worked on a bunch of cartoons. I'm even going to give it to you if you can just name me two, and they go together. Um, if you can tell me at least two of the cartoons that J. Michael Straczynski worked on in the 80s, uh, go to his Wikipedia, check it out. You'll win these prizes. If you've already read Crossover, uh, nice. there you go, yeah. Renee. I was going to say you can give it to a friend. Yes. 
J. Michael. I'm glad those are the ones that I was going to only write down those three answers, Renee. And then I was like, no, I should write down the other ones just in case. But J. Michael Straczynski actually worked on the writing for He-Man and She-Ra and the real Ghostbusters. Um, he also worked on a show called Jace and the Wheeled Warriors and Spiral Zone. <laughs> I know. I am. But... Oh, I did not man. realize he worked on He-Man and She-Ra. And if you go in and look at, he wrote the script, and I already forgot what movie it was, but there's another movie that I absolutely loved, and J. Michael Straczynski wrote the script for, and I was like, I never would have caught that. So go in, check out J. Michael Straczynski's uh, IMDb or Wikipedia, because apparently he's been working on a lot of film and TV shows that we all love, um, other than just writing a bunch of comics we love. He's an impressive guy. That's true. Uh, that said, once again, I want to give a shout out to Blake. I almost just knocked over my wine glass trying to reach for the wine. I want to give out a shout out to our subscriber, Blake, for giving us this amazing bottle of Chateau Smith. Um, it's a cab sab from Washington State. It was absolutely delicious. Did you enjoy it? I did, yes. Yeah, uh, I know Matt Matt and I have definitely enjoyed it. It's been really good, wonderful. Um, thank you, Blake, for that. And, um... Thank you all for watching. We've got a ton of cool stuff coming up this week. I know, like Chad said, there's a lot of great new releases coming out this week. Looking forward to that. Uh, don't forget September 13th, a week from tomorrow, we will have Literati Press here for an ink and draw come out. Uh, support Literati Press. Even if you don't know how to draw, it's a great opportunity to um, just get to meet some creators. I'm sure they'll probably bring some books. It'll be fun. They usually have books on them when they come, so come check it out. It's going to be a lot of awesome times for everyone. Um, and, yeah, if we don't see you uh, this week in the store, we'll see you on the live stream next Sunday here at 9 o'clock. It's going to be a, a great time. I can't wait to talk about some of those books. The fact that Me, Love in the Dark is on there means we're going to have a lot to talk about. That's the only book I'm going to want to talk about. It's going to be the only book we want to talk about. If you haven't read Middle West yet, just know that next week I'm also going to recommend that you read Middle West. So now yeah. it's time to just pick it up. Other than that, thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you uh, in the shop this week for New Comic Book Day on Wednesday. Have a good night, everybody. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.